Joe Rogan Podcast, check it out. The Joe Rogan Experience. Train by day, Joe Rogan Podcast by night, all day. Good to see you guys. When did uh, we do the podcast before? What year was it? Was it? 10 years ago. 10 wow, or years ago. that's crazy. You were one of the first guests that I remember going... We got to. I got to talk to that lady. I go. We got to find them because the 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 piece to Oxycontin Express that you did. I'm like that was a mind blower. That was when I first found out about what was going on in the pill mills down in Florida. I was like, that is fucking insane. And um, that was like in the beginning of the podcast, the early days. It was. Yeah, yeah. you reached out to me on Twitter, and it was super. Is that exciting. what it was? Yeah. <laughs> it's like, do you want to come on the show? I was like, heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Um, I love your new show. First of all, tell people what it is, what it's called, and how they For can... sure. So it's called Trafficked. It's on Wednesdays, 9 p.m. on National Geographic. And uh, in every episode, we go on a journey, a wild journey into black markets around the world. You do real boots-on-the-ground investigative journalism. You are a fucking gangster woman. <laughs> The shit that you did in Peru and in Colombia, I was watching that episode on cocaine. I, my hands were sweating watching you do this. It's like you were, you went to the places where they're growing it, to the places where they make it. Whoo! Yeah, that, that was you marched with the people that carry it through the route when they're carrying it in their backpacks. Yeah, I was like, oh, my God, like you're risking your life, like l genuinely risking your life. I don't like to see it that way. You know, no story is worth uh, a life. So I hate I hate, you know, we, we min minimize the risk. But, you know, there's these are important stories to tell. These black markets are happening all around us. They're super widespread. I think we have this idea that they're happening in sort of faraway lands and deep and secret locations, but they're not. And they have a real impact on our lives. Um, so there is a reason why we do the kind of reporting. And you're right, you know, boots on the ground, uh, old school journalism, I think, is more important now than ever. And we are seeing less of it nowadays. Um, it's so hard to do. I mean, yeah. to find someone willing to do what you did for that cocaine episode. I watched it last night. I was... I was sweating. I was like nervous. I was riveted. It's it, it's such a it's such a dangerous, but yet it's so much more illuminating than any other kind of journalism. You could say, "Oh, this is happening in Colombia. Oh, this is happening in Peru," and I'll just sit at home going, "Oh, I guess that's happening in Colombia." Right. But to see you, who I know, yeah. there going there, and to see all the stuff that you had to go through to meet with these people and to gain their trust. Yeah. <sighs> I would say also, I would add to that, that, you know, we did Mexico with fentanyl. We did guns here in the U.S. going to Mexico. We did tigers in Asia and all these uh, different scams in Jamaica and Israel. And I think a big important reason or goal for us with this show, uh, and for me in particular, because it's the way that I approach my job and my career as a journalist, is to not only be there to inform of what's happening, like you were saying, but also I think it's important for people to connect to people in these faraway lands that at first glance we have nothing in common, right? These are the bad guys operating in far distant lands or maybe sometimes around us, but they're considered the bad people, uh, the people that we have nothing in common with. But if you actually sit down with them and listen to their stories, and this is the big shocker of this show, and I think it rubs people the wrong way sometimes when you admit or, or when somebody tells you that, uh, look, actually there is not a lot that differentiates you from the guy smuggling cocaine out of the Peru, the Vrain Valley in Peru. Uh, you both have the same, are motivated by the same goals, which is, you know, happiness, uh, an opportunity in life, a chance for, you know, to reach your dreams. Um, and unless you actually look at it this way and start realizing that that is more often than not the case, of course there's a lot of bad people there doing it for greed and solely greed. That also happens, and I spent a lot of time with those people as well. But unless you start understanding sort of the root causes of what leads people into these lives, you're never going to be able to address black markets. Well, you really did a fantastic job of getting close to these people and talking to them like you know they were talking about their family they were talking about their children um the one guy who is the chemist who wants to get out because he wants to go to school and like oh this is God. my last year 
Yeah. It's it's uh, it's yeah. horrible. That story alone, we spent the night with these mochileros, these backpackers, teenagers who carry the loads of cocaine on their back out of the valley and spending time with them and, uh, you know, really dangerous work. They tell us stories about how they hike for days on end out of the Amazon, uh, the Rain Valley, um, to a place where then it's sent out into outside of the country to Europe and to the United States. And you spend time with these guys and you listen to them and, and, and it's incredibly dangerous work too. They've seen their best friends being killed in front of them. And I asked them, so why would you ever want to do something like this? You know, And he's like, look, very simple. I grew up in a very poor family. I always wanted to go to college. I knew that the only job opportunities, the whole economy is essentially sustained by the growing of coca leaves, production of cocaine and smuggling of cocaine. So the only job opportunity here I had was this. And I asked him, well, why do you want to go to college so badly? Perhaps a stupid question. But uh, he said, you know, because I want to be a dentist. And I said, why a dentist? Because I want to make, make, make people smile. And this just is like, these are the moments that I think will really stay with me. Yeah, and, and it was so genuine. Like the, the experience was so raw, like all of it from showing the families growing the coca leaves. And yeah. I learned something from it. I always assumed that it was the organized crime cartels that were growing the coca leaves. But no, it's these families, these very poor families yeah. that are growing these coca leaves and drying them out by the road yeah. where everyone can see. Yeah. So you have children playing, you have these very poor people that are growing this this crop and the vast majority of it is sold to the cartels and they they're not selling it for a lot of money either no not at all it's never the people at the bottom that are making money it's always the people at the top but it's crazy that these are the people that are growing it yeah like this whole valley has been growing coca for thousands of years it's what they do and it's also crazy that the thing itself the coca leaf like there's actually been people that have made a really good argument that not only should that stuff be legal but it's probably good for you yeah the coca leaf a lot if alone if it is not uh, made into cocaine it's uh if you they chew it you know you go to the andes and all around they actually chew the coca leaf i had an opportunity to do that there was a moment where one of them i mean you do it it helps you without high altitude sickness and it helps you gain more an energy and uh when we were filming with a group they actually wanted me to try some i had tried some before but i did it as well well then and uh, and it tastes it's actually it doesn't taste it's it's kind of tastes like a leaf quite frankly uh, but you do feel a little bit more energy and there's nothing there's nothing illegal about that by the way that's completely something that's been doing they've been it's been the tradition in this area for you know thousands of years mm. and when you did it like what it gave you energy like what did it feel like it's not like a bump of cocaine. Have you done a bump of cocaine? I actually have not. You know, it's so no? funny because I spent my entire life reporting on drugs and dr the drug trade. And I am, and I'm, you know, people, you know, like do crazy shit for a living. Uh, and yet I am terrified of drugs. I think partly because I've seen how they're done. Um, well, after the Oxycontin Express and seeing how many people's lives are destroyed by a legal drug, uh, I could... I could imagine why you would want to avoid the ones that are illegal. I've never done coke either. That's why I'm asking. Oh, you haven't? No, never. No. Oh, I think we're some of the only two people. I took tea once, mate de coca tea. Uh-huh. Have yeah, you ever had that? Made with coca leaves. Yeah. yeah. And I couldn't shut the fuck up, which really? is a problem already. <laughs> That's a problem with me too. That's exactly my problem, is that I am high energy all the time. Yeah. If I were to do cocaine, then I don't think anyone could exactly. take me. <laughs> exactly. I, I, my friend Jimmy in high school, when we were... Uh, when we were young, uh, one of his buddies was uh, was selling coke, and uh, and he go he just looked at me. and He goes, "You should never do this stuff." <laughs> I go, "Why?" He goes, "Because I think you'd love it." And I'm like, "Okay." That's partly my problem too. I'm afraid that I'm gonna. Like I think everybody loves it. it. I think it makes you feel amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's got to be a reason why it's so popular. You know, I've smoked weed and I hated it. Actually, it made me totally paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> Again, probably one of the only ones. I smoked it for the first time when I was 18, and all my friends had smoked weed before. It was actually, it was, uh, what do you call it? In Portugal, it's not weed. It's um, the stuff that comes from hash? Morocco hash. Yeah. Uh, and made me totally paranoid and since smoked weed a few times. And it, again, it just it's not, it doesn't. I once ate Happy Pizza in Cam Cambodia. That was a funny story. Happy Be Pizza with marijuana? Yeah, yeah. I had no idea I had <gasps> marijuana, though. I was oh, filming no. there, and my, the people that I was with were saying, you can just have this. And I spent the entire night thinking 
that they wanted to come after and rape me and do all sorts of things. It was the <sighs> scariest night. Yeah, it's uh, it's not something you should just dive right into. I, I tell anybody, if you've, if you've never smoked pot and you're thinking about doing it, just take a tiny bit, a point where you don't even think it's working. Mm-hmm. Like, that's what you want. You want right. it like this. Ready? That's right. it. Just a little. Just a little. And if you can handle that a couple hours later mm-hmm. or the next day, then take a little bit more. But right. don't take like five hits and don't smoke hash. Yeah. Oh, my God. I know. Hash is crazy. It's crazy. That's like really concentrated. I know. Like That's a... all we had growing up in Portugal. Oh, my God. We goodness. didn't have weed. That well, was you're not all. playing games That's in it. Portugal. <laughs> not... <laughs> you know, it's only one of the only countries in the world yeah. was the first one to decriminalize drugs. With spectacular results. Spectacular results. Yeah. That's, it's really, uh, that was one of the things that I wanted to bring up with you because uh, it's so, it's such a complicated issue, uh, drugs, and it's so sad to see from your program to see these poor farmers to these kids who are the chemists who are putting it together and then carrying it out Mm -hmm. on the backpack. And one of the chemists was actually one of the guys who was actually carrying it on his back too, which is even crazier. Yeah, And he jumped into the car the first night that we got access to this illicit lab where we've been trying for so long to get this access. And suddenly we're driving in the middle of the night to go up to this area where we're supposed to meet him. And uh, suddenly the, the, guy driving our car this our guide basically stops the car the door opens this guy jumps in and they're speaking in spanish and i interrupt and say what's what's happening who are you you know our car has all our gear and my team and he's like oh sorry sorry hi i'm the chemist what i'm the one who's going to take you down to the to my cocaine lab is the guy who's driving is his name ceviche yeah that's that's his real name yeah that's not weird i mean that's his nickname oh like taco yeah Yeah, Yeah, i have a friend dan's name his nickname is taco yeah um so when you first started to uh, put this show together, mm-hmm. how did you make these connections? Like, how do you, how do you do yeah. that it's without a, revealing sources? Yeah, for sure. It's been I've been doing it for over fifteen years, right? So I've been working in the underworld and black markets almost my whole career as a journalist. So I have connections um, in a lot of places, but mostly we really rely a lot on local journalists. They're really sort of the unsung heroes of uh, our our industry. Um, they usually don't get the credit, um, and they're usually the ones that have the most uh, to lose if something goes wrong. So we take we protect our the people that talk to us, our sources, we take that very seriously. We disguise their faces. We make sure they're okay with what they look like. We change their voices. We don't reveal locations. I mean, it's a lot of work put into making absolutely sure that no one, you know, that law enforcement is going, isn't going to find them. And that's because that's what you do as a journalist. You're there to witness and to report and inform. Um, what is their motivation to help you? I think it's three reasons. Uh, one is ego. Um, these are some of the best of the best at what they do. You know, the best we filmed with one of the best uh, guys at finishing fake U.S. dollars in Peru. He was by hand, ha- you know, note by note, uh, finishing uh, each single one of them to make it look and smell and feel and taste like a real uh, dollar. Um, and he's the best at what he does, and nobody knows what he does. His family doesn't know. And so th- we give them an opportunity to disguise their identity and to sort of boast and talk about what they're passionate about. Um, you know, the same with the chemists, the same with the Sinaloa chemists that we filmed making fentanyl in front of us. Um, so I think partly it's that. Then it's impunity. In a lot of these parts of the world where we filmed, there's complete impunity. Um, so they don't see really a downside to talking to an international recognized name like Nat Geo. And there's trust there as well. And then lastly, and I think most surprising for me, but I think it's the biggest amount, the biggest reason we were given constantly, is this idea that they know they're considered the bad people. Um, They know they're, Mm. you know, the most shunned people in our society. And we're giving them an opportunity to tell their story um, and how, you know, people really want others to know, to, to know why they fall into a life of crime or why they become outlaws. Um, and that, you know, it's a, was a really big goal for me in this documentary was to even, again, the people that are more, that we think have nothing in common with us actually do. Um, and no matter how far you travel into the fringes of our society, that you can still find people that are redeemable and relatable. We're just lucky if we live here. We're just lucky. 
you're just lucky that you were born in, you know, if you live in Austin, you're lucky you're born here. If you live in L.A. or San Francisco, you're lucky. If you're born in Chicago, you're lucky. Absolutely. It's I just, say that all the time. We yeah. won the lottery ticket, and I yeah. don't think most people, if you don't travel and you don't experience this, uh, like I've been privileged to, I don't think we realize that. Well, we're not grateful enough for that. I think it needs to be shown in, a, like, the what you showed in that cocaine episode you see these people, you see these children playing on that car and, you know, and hanging out by these cocoa leaves that are being dried out. And you realize like, oh, this is this is not what I thought it was. This isn't, you know, some movie where you got these bad guys that are, you know, guarding the farm with machine guns like that. Right. This is not it. Like no. you just have poor farmers. Yeah. I mean, that exists, too. <laughs> you know, we filmed yeah, a lot of sure. armed guards uh, protecting their money and their operations as well. Um, but I would say that in the vast majority of cases, it really is the lack of opportunities. I really don't believe that anyone is born one day and decides, hey, you know, what I want to do is uh, I want to become a sicario for the Sinaloa cartel and be killed when I'm 25 years old. Uh, I want to kill people and then be killed when I'm 25, which happened. The poverty was, it was obvious even in the people that were protecting their crops and everything. Like they have poor, they have shitty old guns. With, like, okay. iron sights on them and, po and shitty rifles. Yeah. Shitty old guns, yeah. Yeah, you can see, like, this is not some, like, super sophisticated operation of... It's uh, it's taking advantage of people that... Or, or is it even... It's just, like, this is the ecosystem, right? And the ecosystem, this is what I was going to get at before, only exists because drugs are illegal. And if the ecosystem was different, if drugs were legal... Mm -hmm. And then all I mean, how long would it take? How many decades would it have to take before a large pharmaceutical company or some alcohol company or a tobacco company said, fuck it, let's grow Coke mm -hmm. and then just started selling it legally, mm -hmm. like 100 percent pure cocaine. The price would probably drop. Mm -hmm. It would be much more accessible. Would people do it more is the question. You know, that's what we're seeing with the marijuana business in California right now. Um, yeah. Where it was legalized, and what's happening is that the people that have been operating these, at the time, illegal shops for weed and operations for weed are now being kicked out of the business, and there's all these bigger companies coming in and taking, uh, you know, taking away the business from them. From them. Well, um, there's a little bit of that, um, but there's still a lot of people that are just growing it now, and they're it's not just big businesses. It's a, I know a lot of people that grow sure. pot. It's a yeah. lot of small businesses too yeah. that and, grow and it doing and sell so it. illegally still. The black market is oh, yeah. still huge in California for weed because people don't want to pay taxes. Well, that was the thing up in Humboldt, you know, like in that the Emerald Triangle mm -hmm. or whatever yeah. they call it up there. Like they didn't want any part. Like there's people out there that grew pot that voted against it being legalized, and you know I have friends that were trying to explain it to me. They're like we don't want this to be legal. I'm like, you are cutting off your nose to spite your face. Like you, you're missing the whole point. I, mm -hmm. I get, you don't want to pay taxes, but do you, do you like living under the threat of being locked in a cage? Mm -hmm. And do you think that the other people that grow it and sell it or the other people that even possess it, mm -hmm. like, don't you, don't you want progress in this regard where kids can grow up and become adults in a world where you have autonomy, you have control over your body, you have the freedom. Because like I was saying to this one guy, I was like, he was anti-marijuana. We had this conversation. I said, okay, what do you think it should be illegal? He goes, yeah. I go, do you understand what illegal means? It means you can put someone in jail for doing something that you don't agree with that doesn't hurt anybody other than yourself, right? Or other than the person that's doing right. it. Like why would you, if it was just two of us, the only mm -hmm. two people in the world, and you thought pot should be illegal and you made the rule and I want to smoke pot, you would lock me in a cage? Does right. that make sense? No, it doesn't. So why does it make sense if there's 200 million people or 2 billion people? No. It doesn't. No. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't. With adults, adults should be able to do whatever. They, if you could go buy whiskey, which I like whiskey, mm -hmm. you should be able to buy whiskey. Why, why can't you buy pot? It makes no sense. Yeah, and I we know whiskey will fuck you up. We know there's a reason why Alcoholics Anonymous mm -hmm. exists. Right. People have huge problems mm -hmm. with alcohol. Why? Why can't we figure out how to do that with these other compounds? And they're trying to do that in Oregon. You know, Oregon just legalized everything. They de decriminalize everything, including steroids. They're, they decriminalize psychedelics. Mm -hmm. They decriminalize everything. 
which is going to be very weird to see how that works up well, there. Well, we have the example of Portugal, though, mm-hmm. right? And it's, again, it's worked really well. Our incarceration r- rates have gone down. Uh, AIDS, which was high, went down. Uh, all the money that the government was spending on incarcerating people, they're now spending on rehab centers and making sure that people get the health they need. Um, and people and with this addiction. is hard drugs. I'm not talking about yeah. weed, of course. I'm talking about heroin. heroin. Yeah. yeah. And people with addictions, yeah. that's gone down as well. It's Absolutely. really crazy. It's yeah. been, it's been, uh, there's a problem with people too that if you tell them they can't do something, they want to do it. And if you tell them something's illegal, they want to be naughty. Yeah. Like, they, they... also, there's a lot of money. I think mostly it's about the money that's to be made with an illegal business. Yes. You know? and, and I'm not just talking about the traffickers, I'm talking about corruption. I'm talking about where all that money uh, ends up. But in this, what I wanted to get to is like in doing this show and seeing these people from the poor farmers to these kids that are risking mm-hmm. their lives and then like as you said seeing their friends get murdered for this drug and they're making a tiny fraction of the profit off of this to getting to these nightclubs and even the guy that you showed in miami that was selling coke like even he was making a pittance in comparison to the cartels in comparison to it, it it's just disheartening it's like they i know they're trying to get by and i know i'm like the guy was talking about like feeding his family mm-hmm. You know, but you're also you're you're in this horrible system that you're probably never going to get out. And if you do get out, what are you going to do now? Hey, Mike, uh, it says here for the last 15 years, you've done nothing. Like, what have you been doing? Right. Oh, I've been selling coke. Right. Like, you can't say that. Right. Like, I, met, I managed to get out of the game right. without getting shot and killed. So mm-hmm. uh, I'm on the straight and, and narrow. Like, well. Thank you for your time. Like, you, no one's going to hire you. <laughs> yeah, no one's going to hire you. I get so much flack for that, uh, for showing that side, for humanizing this. I definitely flack get from who? Uh, I get comments on my work sometimes, um, you know, especially since the show started airing where people reach out and say, and, you know, there's their stories. You know, I understand part of it. It's, for example, the one, the first one that we aired, we aired the first two were the scams episode and then the fentanyl one where we follow the pipeline of fentanyl all the way from the coast of Mexico where we saw, we filmed uh, the precursor chemicals that come from Asia being thrown overboard. And then we filmed a speedboat that belongs to the cartel or cartel operators picking up these barrels and then moving them eventually to a lab. We saw fentanyl being made. We saw then fentanyl being packed. And then eventually at the end, we saw it being smuggled um, into California from Mexico. And uh, we were there when a woman, in this case, she was pregnant, American citizen, uh, drove into the United States with five kilos of fentanyl inside, hidden inside her car. And there was a moment where she actually gets called for secondary inspection. And we're close to her. We're filming. I mean, we're not filming her because we're keeping the cameras low, but I am watching what is happening. And as you know, I've been reporting on the opiate crisis for many years, and I've spent numerous amount, countless times with uh, mothers who've lost loved ones to the opiate epidemic. So to me, that was very hard on my shoulders, the idea that on one hand, I was seeing this woman, and I knew she had kids, she was pregnant, and I I knew what that meant for her family if she got caught. Uh, and on the other hand, I also knew what would that mean would mean for American families if the drugs went across and were, went, came through. So it was a really hard time for me as a journalist. And I think I get flack for that, for not being absolutely clear that, you know, I think people would prefer if I was just, okay, these are bad people. And uh, because there's so much suffering around some of these trades, right, such as fentanyl uh, and even cocaine, um, that I think people... Uh, just have an easier time in life thinking of the world as black and white, that they are bad people. We would never do that. You know, us in that position would never do that. And I think it's a harder, um, more challenging look of life if you realize that actually it's a lot more gray and that people are a lot more similar to us. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why your work is so important is because you do take those risks and you do show the, the human side of the people that we like to demonize. We like yeah. to demonize them and think of them as being just evil, this evil scourge that comes from the, these other places to our good place. Yeah. And it's, and I was there to witness it, and I didn't do anything to stop it is usually what I get told. You, they're That's, foolish. The yeah. people that are saying that are foolish. And I understand their perspective as well. I understand, especially if they have loved ones yeah. that they've lost to fentanyl. Um, and I know people. I know people that have uh, died from it, and I know people that have problems with it, and, and not just problems. It's like ruin their lives. Mm-hmm. I know people that have had injuries, and then from that injury, they just went down a road and oh. never returned. Yeah. 
and they went down a road with the doctor prescribed mm-hmm. opiates and they never came back and they're mm-hmm. never the same again. Yeah. And then now they're addicts. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's the most helpless feeling. And if it's family members and if someone you care about, it's, you don't know what you can do. You don't know when they don't want to listen. They're, they're, they're lost. And you, you would lose your life trying to help them. You will lose your life if you try to pick them up and wake them up every day and mm-hmm. take them to a rehab and take them. You'll lose your life because mm-hmm. there's not a, you, you can't babysit an adult. So what do you do? And so I see the perspective from the person that's saying, you should do something. You Me should too. have stopped it. Mm-hmm. I but, do too, but I'm a journalist, right? But you have to do it the way you do it because yeah. there's not that many people doing it. Yeah. The and, way you do it, there's very, very few people that are willing to right. show it raw like that. And that's what people need to see. We need to understand that this is a, like a super complex issue. Do you remember there was a really corny uh, drug uh, ad, uh, uh, one of those say no to drug ads from the Bush administration, I believe? I think it was the Bush administration, where um, there was this guy who is one of these uh, silly sort of like uh just the facts ma'am republicans and he's eating they're eating in a restaurant and the guy's eating he's like uh he goes if if you buy drugs you support terrorism like and he's like what like what are you saying it was when the terrorism craze like i believe it was post 9 11. oh wow and um and he goes why do you say that he goes because it's a fact it's a fact (laughs) and that's it like no stats no nothing but this guy Mm -hmm. who a lot of people represents your father Mm -hmm. or your boss this like really like cold sort of like fact-based no nonsense super successful guy Mm -hmm. who's telling this fool this liberal fool if you buy drugs you support terrorism and it was like the weirdest campaign and it's it didn't work and people mocked it surprising (laughs) well it's just but this this is the attitude that people have like you should stop them you should stop them without ever questioning what what what, what, what you're doing is so important because you're showing you're, you're showing human beings who got handed like a terrible roll of the dice a bad hand of cards that's it and they're stuck in this very poor village in Peru with with dirt roads and no money and no opportunity and no right. way out. And this is what the most of the people do. They grow coca. Right. And we can either choose to ignore it and pretend it's not there and not do, you know, just keep on demonizing these people and keep on consuming and keep on buying because that's why. It's because there's demand or else it wouldn't exist. Or we can actually go and shine a light and try and understand why they happen, why these people turn to black markets and why the trade exists and try to do something about it well in a lot of ways it's as gross as it sounds i think that is the your your expose on this is one of the best arguments for legalization like to show people i yes this is all horrible however you're not going to stop people from doing drugs people have been doing drugs since the beginning of time if you say people shouldn't do drugs Mm -hmm. because drugs are bad because it's a fact. Yeah. <laughs> if you're one of those guys, like, okay, simple. Like, you, you've just taken, like, one of the most complex, nuanced problems the world has ever known. Human beings love to perturb their consciousness. They've yeah. been doing it forever. Monkeys do it. Mm-hmm. They, they drink fermented fruit. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they, they eat things that they know can get, get them high. Fucking jaguars do it in the Amazon. They eat leaves that they know are psychedelic, and they lie down and, and trip out. Animals love to do it. Humans are animals. We, we're never going to stop. And, and as long as there's legal drugs, too. By the way, there's so many drugs. Like just coffee, right? Cigarettes. You wanted a cigarette before the show started. Hey, Joe. <laughs> Sorry, I ran you out. <laughs> it's you only gonna, when I get nervous. I get it. But I mean, look, these are drugs. These are all drugs. There's yeah. so many drugs. You know, are, is, is, is that yeah. a, like a, a valid parallel? You know, coffee and cocaine? No, I don't think it is. But it's also a drug, alcohol, t- tobacco, all these different prescription drugs. These are all drugs. I don't think that we can keep doing what we're doing and pretending that we're doing the right thing. Yeah, and spending billions of dollars in the process of trying to combat thing something. You know, yeah. the drug war. Uh, you know, the U.S. has spent billions of dollars in something that has been a huge failure. 
yeah. a huge failure. Like violence is increasing in Mexico every year. Uh, the drugs are coming across easy, easy, easier than ever. Yeah. So it's not making a dent. You know, it really isn't. No, it's propping up organized crime. The yeah. same thing that happened in America during the prohibition. prohibition. Right. I mean, that's where Al Capone got all his money. That's where the Kennedys, allegedly, not not necessarily true, right? Supposedly not. Supposedly know. not. I think they got a good PR agent. Hey. These motherfuckers. Um, but whoever was profiting off of moonshine and uh, illegal whiskey, they're, they're still selling it. You know, speakeasies were still open. They just, you know, you had a special knock on the door and you had to know somebody, but they were still drinking. People like to drink. I, I don't do Coke and you don't do Coke. So you and I, we could look at this, I, I think, as objectively as possible. I think it should be legal. I don't want my children to do it. I don't want my friends to get addicted to Neither it. Neither do I, yeah. But I also think maybe the only way we're going to really resolve it is if you have treatment centers and rehabilitations that are funded by the profit off of legalized cocaine and heroin and all these other drugs. If we had, look, if, if heroin is legal tomorrow, I'm not going to fucking do heroin. Like, I don't want to do heroin, but it is legal in Oxycontin. I mean, you could, exactly. That's basically that the same exactly thing, true. right? Yep. They, there should be, if you want to make sense of this, there should be some sort of a percentage of the profits that has to go to rehabilitation centers. And then there's another one, Ibogaine. Ibogaine has been proven to be the very best method for many people for kicking addictions. Mm -hmm. And not just addictions of, of chemicals, but addictions of like endogenous chemicals, mm -hmm. like gambling. Mm -hmm. Like people that are gambling addicts have found great relief with Ibogaine. People that are addicted to alcohol, people that are addicted to a lot of different controlled substances have found amazing relief through Ibogaine. And Ibogaine is not something you get addicted to. It is a, a ruthlessly introspective drug, and you have to go to Mexico to do it. There's Ibogaine clinics. My friend Ed Clay, he started a clinic down in Mexico because he got hooked on pills because he got hurt, and he wanted to figure out how to get off of them, found out about Ibogaine, did it. It was so mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. He decided to open up a clinic. I, I knew it was for, I didn't know, I thought it was just for opiates. I had no idea that it cured, or it helped cure so many of the other A lot addictions. of personality disorders. Wow. Yeah, a lot of people, there's a lot of weird addictions that people have that are in in many ways connected to trauma. You know, Gabor Monte thinks that like almost all addiction is connected to childhood trauma mm -hmm. and he makes a very compelling argument mm -hmm. about it. And uh, it's interesting to hear him discuss it because everyone that I know that's an addict has had a fucked up childhood. You know, mm -hmm. it, it kind of makes sense. There's There's something there that was off and wrong or there's abuse or there's mm -hmm. something and a lot of soldiers there's a, oh, a so ton nice. of soldiers mm -hmm. that come back and they have severe ptsd and then on top of that they have cte so they have like legitimate right trauma right. physical trauma right. to their brain and they wind up getting addicted yeah. and they also get injured in yes. the field a lot yes. and then they're given oxycontins and other painkillers yeah. and yeah it's a recipe for disaster really but we have this sort of we're like a cat. Like, my cat used to play this game where he would hide, but he would hide and his tail would be sticking out. And I'd be like, bitch, I see you. But if he couldn't see me, he thought I couldn't see him. And I'd grab his tail and he'd poke his head out and swat at me. <laughs> and then he'd go back in there. I'm like, bitch, I see you. <laughs> and we would play games, you know. But it was fun. But I would laugh. But, like, I think he thinks that I can't see him because he can't see me. Like, it's a childish game. But it's a fucking cat, right? Yeah. They're, we're playing the same oh, kind of stupid game. That's right on, yeah. That's you exactly know, it's like absolutely. we're pretending that drugs are illegal when drugs are everywhere. Yeah. We're pretending we're stopping drugs by keeping them illegal, but we're just propping up organized crime. It's so much worse. This simplistic approach to it, this childlike approach to it, is there is not a single intelligent person, if you laid out the facts and they looked at it objectively, would think that this is a successful method yeah. of handling this. Yeah, and we keep spending money. You know, We keep pretending that we don't know that what we're doing and the billions of dollars we're spending on this is we pretending that it's making a difference, and it really isn't. And we have a war on it. Yeah. This is the, the shittiest war that the United States has ever fought. If you think we did a bad job in Vietnam and Afghanistan, and I, but at least we didn't... like. The, the war on drugs has been a lo loss. Like, they've lost every year. They've every never year. won the war on drugs. When you showed those Coast Guard people, that was incredibly illuminating because 
the way that guy described it, where he said, you're dealing with an area that we patrol that's larger than the United States, and we have about four boats. Yeah. And you're like, what? He's like, imagine four police cars patrolling the entire United States. Then you know how this, yeah. these drugs are getting in. Yeah. You know, I spent a lot of time with law enforcement, and uh, you hear their stories, and, you know, they're really out there on the front lines trying to make a difference, most of them. And... Again and again, you hear just how frustrating their job is because they know, uh, you know, that they're really not making a dent. Um, but I think it's also hard to admit in many ways because this is their lives and their livelihoods um, that if you talk to law enforcement, even now, I actually just did a story for season two about weed, black market weed in, in California. And, uh, and even now, you know, they will tell you that that's – they think that uh, it shouldn't have been legalized um, because they have a point. Black market weed has only exploded since legalization, but I don't think that not making legal is – it's really about the regulations that are in place in California. Sounds like they're thinking like cops. Yeah. The, the, the real <laughs> problem is um, uh, my friend John Norris, who's been on the podcast before, he is a game warden. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, hot. he got a job as a game warden because he loves the outdoors, mm -hmm. and he thought he was just gonna like check people's fishing licenses mm -hmm. and things along those lines. Oh yeah. And along the way, he started finding these dr grow ops on public land, and so his department became a tactical drug enforcement department to fight cartels who are illegally growing marijuana. And so they have like trained Belgian Malamois who at attack these cartels. They get shot at. He's lost members of his team. Mm -hmm. Like they're like a tactical group now. And he yeah. wrote a drug. Was it Hidden Hidden War? Was that what it, the uh, the book? We have it at the old studio. We spent the summer actually filming yeah. that those operations. Hidden War. Um, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, it's and crazy. His take is that what happened was when they made marijuana legal, mm -hmm. what they did was they made growing it illegally a misdemeanor. So in most of the country, marijuana is still illegal in most states, right? So if you have 50 states, how many states is it like 19 or something where it's legal? How many states is it legal? 80% of all of the marijuana supplied to the states where it's illegal is grown in California and it's grown on public land and it's grown by the cartels. So they move these guys in and they're incredibly industrious. I mean, you want to talk about hardworking dudes. These guys walk in like 10, 15 miles into public land with all the equipment on their back, mm -hmm. like their camp. They, they have like the hoses and, and they take the water. They create their own dams and take the water from these creeks. And they run it into their grow ops. That's how they found it. They thought that like a farmer was uh, it was channeling the river or a creek away from uh, the, these uh, steelhead and salmon fisheries, and it turned out it was like the cartel. Yeah. Like so, they followed the the dry yeah. creek up into this like crazy right. marijuana grow op. We went to one of these grows this summer with an operation much like that, and it was funny because all of the. Uh, law enforcement that was there, they were brought in sort of, you know, those ropes on helicopters where mm -hmm. they come and they drop them because it's really out there in the middle of the forest. Uh, but they couldn't do that to us. So we had to actually drive part of the way and then hike down. And it took us like, you know, almost a whole day of hiking through like thick brush to get to this area where they were diverting water and where there's marijuana growing all around us. And it was all cartel operated. And you realize just like what these guys have to go through because then it's also on a weekly basis they have to get supplies and food and they have to get the, you know, the drugs out of there. So it is actually a lot of work. If those guys were working like a regular job, yes. they'd like be the best employees ever. Yeah. But They're like, this guy's... Dude, that's what I see in all of these black markets. You know, these are some of the most industrious. You might not, agree, obviously, you don't agree with what they're doing. You might not even like them, but they, you have to give it to them. They're industrious. They're hardworking. They're, they're really creative. Um, you know, the things that I've seen that people do to hide their product, to make their product, to make it better, to make it stronger, it's really incredible. Well, it's crazy to watch the method. When you see the method of how they cut the cocaine on your show, mm -hmm. where they're pouring cement into it you're like what and then gasoline just uh -huh. giant jug and then like uh, all mm -hmm. the other shit that they're all the different chemicals acid mm -hmm. you're like oh my god this is cr i had no idea yeah. i had no idea that's how they make it yeah it's so so another episode that we filmed recently was here in austin was actually meth 
Meth uh, is in Austin? Yes. And Austin's we were, got a meth we dro- problem. On my way driving here to the show, I passed by the place where I had filmed just three weeks ago, actually, this uh, this guy in his hotel room, a dealer, a meth dealer. But he was washing one of the things he did before he started getting clients. And the clients are not the people that you think are meth users at all, by the way. We filmed, we interviewed a lawyer. We interviewed a mom with kids at home. It was an entrepreneur, not at all the people that you think are meth users. And this guy... Before he started, he's washing the meth, um, and that's because he says he prides himself on selling good quality meth, but he had purchased it from Mexico, and he wasn't sure about the quality, so he washes it. I can't remember what it is, the product that he puts in, but it's to see all the other stuff that comes out, and uh, and him, you know, you can t- and then you can see just sort of all this other chemicals that are put in there, and you sort of realize, and when I was filming in the, the cocaine lab, the same thing, and the fentanyl lab too, the amount of shit that goes into these drugs, if that alone is not going to dissuade you from, from doing them, it's, yeah, it's chemicals, it's gasoline, it's, yeah, lime, lime oh, is something that goes lime. into a lot of these, oh. you know, yeah. They use lime to get rid of bodies. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. The, this um, meth guy, um, was he a big Breaking Bad fan? Was it? Big Brian Cranston fan wanted to. He wanted was. To be the he guy. was actually uh, much younger. I don't I'm sure. You know, one guy that we filmed for the fentanyl episode. It was a, a cartel chemist. So this this guy was a bioengineer, um, and incredibly smart and knowledgeable. And we met him in this abandoned location where he's basically making fentanyl and pressing it into the M30 pills, which are fake. Um, it goes round back to the beginning of the opiate crisis because they make them to look like Oxycontin, like the 30 milligram pills that Purdue Pharma and Oxycontin uh. have. And so, but it's pure fentanyl, essentially. And, uh, and they're becoming really popular on the streets of America and part of, you know, really deadly stuff. And so we saw him making it. And you never know with these guys. Like I spent time in some of these illicit labs where you kind of get a sense that shit could go wrong very fast because they have no idea what they're dealing with. And these are very potent chemicals. But in this case, you know, it's not easy to make. I mean, it, it is because it's cheap, and once you know how to do it, you know how to do it. But it's, you know, I can't show up and try to make that the thing. The whole thing could explode just because the chemicals are so potent. And yet here he was, and I, we were wearing our hazmat suits and our masks and everything. And I started talking to him, and he was, I mean, I suddenly thought I was talking to Walter White from Breaking Bad. He was exactly that, like a, a geek when it came to chemistry and had always loved chemistry and, you know, had worked in chemistry for a while and then was approached by the Sinaloa cartel and they needed a guy who knew how to, how to make this stuff. And, wow. and he's decided, why not? I can make a lot more money making this. And now he's like one of the biggest chemists for the Sinaloa cartel. <sighs> yeah. So when you talk to the people that did the meth... Mm-hmm. Did they have a reason? The people that, that actually consume it. When you said you talked to... Oh, they, they use it? Yeah, the mom yeah, and they, the they, lawyers. It's, and it's a good party um, drug. It's a good... Uh, it's a good it's a, it helps with inhibition. Oh, so I bet. F- for people, yeah. <laughs> and apparently it really helps with uh, sex, especially it's uh, very consumed in, in the gay community as well. Um, it helps, yeah, just uh, having a good time and... It's getting wild. Yeah, getting wild. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you done Adderall? I have not. Good for you. You and I together. Give me some knuckles, woman. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you have another? Yeah, no, but that's a tempting one. People keep telling me how amazing it is for like just cleaning your house. Is it really yeah. that you just get like oh on a Oh, my God. Room? Yeah. Jamie, you've, you've uh, perhaps participated in some... Uh, <clears throat> I've t- taken it twice, but I've done ProVigil now twice. Mm. Not the same in any way, shape, or form. No, ProVigil is... Uh, I have done ProVigil, yeah. and I've done NuVigil, too. NuVigil's in a... It's, it's a, a drug that... Now... This is, I might be wrong about this, so we might have to Google this. I believe it was created as a performance enhancing drug, mm-hmm. but then they said, well, you can't just sell it as a performance enhancing drug, as a cognitive enhancer. And I do believe it has some cognitive boosting, like proven cognitive boosting functions. But I think they decided to sell it as a, a narcolepsy drug as a, when they found out that it keeps people awake. Um, it's a, amazing for road trips. This is what I love it for. Like if I'm dri- like if I used to drive to San Diego to do a gig, and uh, the gig would be over at like midnight, I'm like fuck it, I want to be home, and I would drive two hours. Like around an hour in, you start getting right. that road sleepiness. Yeah. With Pro Vigil, I'm listening to books on tape. I'm fucking howling at the moon. Like, 
I'm wide awake, but I'm not on speed. Mm-hmm. Like it's not like your heart doesn't beat fast. You don't get like eh, right. you you just are a, a weirdly awake. Is this an over the counter drug? No, no, you no. You have to get, get a prescription, prescription um, but it's easy to get a prescription. Huh. Um, it's, <laughs> like yeah, it's, drugs. But I don't think there's a lot of drawbacks to it. Mm-hmm. It's so weird that Tim Ferriss, who uh, is all about biohacking and all about like uh, you know the four hour body, the four hour mm-hmm. work week. He didn't put it in his book. And he told me he didn't want to put it in his book because he was worried that people were going to just fucking eat it like candy. Mm. He's like, I don't want to endorse this. He goes, because I don't think there's such a thing as a biological free lunch. Mm. He goes, when something is doing that to you, there's got to be something that's happening on the other end. Mm-hmm. There's got to be something that, and I don't know what it is, and I don't want to be the guy that says, hey, do this. So I thought that was very interesting. So how different is Adderall from that then? I it's don't just know. Fun, yeah. I don't know because I'm not a, I have not done the Adderall. A lot different. A is lot it? different, yeah. Jamie's I'm looking it both. up. Like Adderall has uh, amphetamine in it. This oh, is right. not. It says yeah. it says a wakefulness promoting agent. I don't know what that means. Right. Yeah. See, uh, but see if the origin of Pro Vigil was the first one, and I b- believe New Vigil they mm-hmm. did they they changed it, they altered it slightly to get around a patent or something. I forget what the exact reason was, but um, these are not they're not speed, but I think they are addictive at least addictive in the fact that it has an effect and impact. Like I was very careful not to take it too often. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes I'd take it before a podcast and I'd be like, Hmm, (laughs) (laughs) wait, even more energy than right now. (laughs) Yes. Well, I'm, I came here right from the gym. So I'm pretty, pretty amped up. Um, but, uh, is that, how how do you stand on steroids by the way? What's your, because one of our episodes was about steroids. I think that steroids are, Many there's there's a lot of different things that are legal now mm-hmm. in terms of like you can get testosterone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy, and they basically give you the vial, right? But only if you have low levels of those of testosterone, right? Mm-hmm. Or can you just you can just kind of get it and you can get low levels mm-hmm. pretty easy. Mm-hmm. All you have to do, like if you want low levels, folks out there, this is not my advice, mm-hmm. but I'm just telling you a fact. All you'd have to do is eat a massive meal and then get your blood taken. Huh. Because if you want to take your blood, um, like the idea is they take your blood when you're fasting, right? Mm. So you're supposed to fast. So I, I think it's 10 hours before your blood work. The reason for that is then your hormone levels will, you know, they'll, they'll level out. They'll be normal. If you crack, like that feeling that you get when you take, have a massive meal, yeah. especially mm-hmm. like high carbohydrate, high sugar. Like if you eat like three Big Macs and fries and a, and a, a large Coke, you'll be like, mm-hmm. boom. <laughs> that feeling, get your blood done right then. You will show very low hormone mm-hmm. levels. You'll show low growth hormone. You'll show low mm-hmm. testosterone. You show low everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Another thing is when people have done steroids. See, I know about this initially because of the UFC, and the UFC had a there was a testosterone a TUE testosterone use exemption, and that testosterone use exemption allowed people to replace their hormones if they showed low levels of hormones. So testosterone replacement therapy was for people that had some sort of a condition that would uh, allow the doctor to prescribe testosterone mm-hmm. for them. The problem with that is a lot of the people that had low testosterone had low testosterone because they were taking they steroids. Just, yeah, exactly. Right. So yeah. you take steroids, your endocrine system crashes, mm-hmm. and then you get on uh, testosterone replacement stero- right. th- therapy and you become a super person. Mm-hmm. This was a real problem in the UFC for several years. Mm-hmm. There was like two or three years where there was a few guys, and I don't need to name names because all you folks know who they are. <laughs> All the people that are MMA fans know exactly mm-hmm. what I'm talking about. But these guys where their career was kind of stagnated, they became fucking murderers for like three years. And then USADA, uh, the U.S. anti-doping agency, mm-hmm. got involved with the UFC. And now USADA is randomly tests everybody. They, they kill testosterone use exemptions. Uh, no more testosterone replacement therapy. And people's bodies melted. Yeah. They shrank. Mm-hmm. And then it, you became entirely the, – the, the sport is – as clean as mm-hmm. you can make it with today's science and mm-hmm. today's technology. Oh. Um, but there's some sports, like let's look at uh, powerlifting. Yes. Or let's look at bodybuilding. Bodybuilding is the best one. Yeah. That's it doesn't cool. exist. It doesn't exist. What do you mean? Testing Bodybuilding doesn't exist. doesn't exist. Oh, right. It Bodybuilding doesn't exist if it with steroids, steroids exists. Yeah. 
body, regular bodybuilding. Like um, I had a friend, uh, my friend Brian, uh, who lived in Boston, was a natural bodybuilder, and he was very dedicated, and he was like legitimate natural bodybuilder. He worked out very hard. He was a, he ate very clean, and he was like super super dedicated. And you would swear he was on steroids. He was big. I mean, like big giant arms, like really thick guy, but just really dedicated. He is nothing like those giants that you see at the gym that are on steroids. There are people that walk around, like if you go to like a Gold's Gym in Venice in, in the heyday when all the elite bodybuilders would go there, they don't even look like humans. They look like walls with feet. I saw it. I went to a bodybuilding competition in Vegas for the show where we were following this kid who was mostly not doing steroids at this time. And like your friend, he was trying to see if he could make it into this competition without... He the heavy use of uh, or heavily using steroids and other uh, PEDs and uh, it was he went on stage and you could see the difference between him and the other guys I mean everybody else there was heavily using PEDs yeah. and then you'd see him we actually followed him we were with this guy called Tony Huge who calls himself Tony Huge Tony Huge, huge. <laughs> have you heard of this guy? <laughs> no he's pretty incredible he has, a, he has a huge following a huge following yeah and he calls himself Dr. Tony Huge even though he's not a doctor but he is a lawyer uh, and he's if anyone it wants is interested in, he, he's basically a spokesperson for steroids. He's uh, mm. uh, people who are bodybuilders. He's also a bodybuilder himself and goes to gyms and competitions. And he was with this kid, and kids adore him. I mean, we spoke to teenagers who look up to Tony Huge and want to do everything he does, uh, which is mostly PDs. And this kid wanted to be, he went to Vegas to help this kid out. And in How the middle of the, kid? he was like 19, I believe. His name is Zach mm. from Florida. Super nice kid. Met his mom, all of it. Uh, but had, had had tried steroids, had had sort of a bad experience with steroids, decided he was going to try and do it with other things, but not steroids, not testosterone itself, but other substances. Tony Huge was helping him out. He gets there day of the competition. He goes on stage, and again, he looks like the others around him who have been doing steroids look so much stronger than him. And he comes out, yet, you know, again, super dedicated kid. Like, this is his life, spends most of his time at the gym and eats right and all that. And in the middle of the competition, Tony Huge says, okay, it's time for us to go back to your apartment and get you ready for round two. They go back, and we filmed all of this, and he opens up a big suitcase, and inside this suitcase, it's like the Mary Poppins <laughs> suitcase that more and more <laughs> shit's coming out, you know, and, and starts giving him injections of insulin and uh, all sorts, I don't know, half of the things that he was giving. And the kid's like, are you sure this is okay? Are you sure this is okay? And, uh, and I'm worried for him. And he says, okay, yeah. I'm starting to feel my heart beating really fast. Uh, you know, you don't, don't, don't you worry. And then he goes back. And you could actually see the transformation in this kid's body within an hour of him taking these drugs. I am not what was it, What is the transformation? What happened? His, his uh, uh, vessels, his blood veins. Vascularity? Yes, were popping. His veins yeah. were, so th that's something good, apparently, for uh, mm. these kind of competitions. Uh, You're funny the way you talk. That's something good, apparently. I know. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my first time at a yeah. bodybuilding competition for sure. It's weird. It's so weird, but it's so weird when you see those people in real life. Yeah, I love wor think worlds that look nothing like what I'm used to. I, mm. I love. I'm so fascinated by them. I was watching a video last night on Vice of a woman who uh, does uh, bodybuilding. She's oh. my height mm -hmm. and my weight. Mm -hmm. She weighed 196 pounds, okay. and uh, so and. She has like her neck is like my neck, mm -hmm. but her traps are even bigger than mine. They start like here, mm -hmm. they go straight down. Her shoulders were massive, Insane. and she was talking like, like this. This, this is what I eat. Yeah, this is uh, every morning I have to consume 6,000 cows. She sounded like The Rock. Yeah, like it it's was crazy, bizarre. Yeah. It was so bizarre. It was so strange to see this weird upset. It's they're like sculptors, right. And in a way, it is kind of an art form. Totally. But what they're doing is freakish. But they're all into it. They yeah. all love it. Yeah. This Tony Huge guy, um, I actually kind of grew very fond of him uh, just because he's so honest about what he does. I don't think his message is very safe for kids, you know, especially. And, you know, taking steroids, you know the side effects and you have to be careful. But yet him saying, you know, I am basically... Uh, a human experiment on myself and I'm trying all of these things and some Is there things... videos of him? Can we see what he looks like? This yeah, Tony Huge, bro? Yeah, he's Does he look ridiculous? Oh, he's gonna love this. Oh, Tony. 
Oh, no, he actually doesn't look ridiculous. He's a uh, yeah, oh, Tony. Tony Hughes. Well, guy. there's a guy who's uh, who died recently who was famous for looking ridiculous. His name was Rich Piana. Do you know who that is? Yeah, I remember when I was doing research for this story. Yeah, I was hearing about that. Um, they don't exactly know if steroids killed him, but it's like you know, if you see a body and then there's a gun right next to the body, like, and the gun, the body has a bullet hole. Oh, he's pretty big. Yeah. He's yeah, but he's tiny compared to Rich Piana. No, yeah. He's... Yeah. Oh, he looks very good. Yeah. See, he doesn't look preposterous. He looks like a, a very big, strong guy. Like right there with the yeah. shirt off picture. Yeah. Still, he looks great. Like that's that is a guy who's in very good shape. Yeah, Doctor. So he says, Hughes. okay, this is. Uh, I used to be handsome. This is maybe six or seven years ago when I was thirty-one or thirty-two. I was still a full-time lawyer, wearing a suit, going to court, meeting clients. Da da da. So yeah, so that is uh, he decided to start taking steroids. That's when he decided. Is that what it says? Okay, so that that can be achieved naturally. That absolutely can be achieved naturally, especially with good genetics. And that's uh, one of the things that uh, I had. Do you know who Ronnie Coleman is? No. Ronnie Coleman's. If there's a Mount Rushmore of bodybuilding, he's on it, hundred percent. It's like Arnold, Franco Colombo, Lee Haney. I mean, how many Mount Rushmore doesn't have enough heads, (laughs) right? Dorian Yates, but Ronnie Coleman is without doubt on mm-hmm. there. He was a multiple time Mr. Olympia, mm-hmm. enormous guy oh, with wow. yeah, with spectacular wow. genetics, spectacular genetics. And Ronnie did the podcast and he said that oh, wow. when he was he's really in rough shape now. Like he can barely walk. His oh. back is really fucked up. He's had many, many surgeries. Wow. And uh, he's basically had every disc in his back fused except for one. And uh, has a really hard time walking and even standing up. Um, but when, but that's because you know he pushed himself so hard. So it wasn't oh just the steroids; God. he pushed himself through pain. So when he got injured, he didn't give a fuck. He just mm-hmm. kept working out hard and stacking weights and mm-hmm. you know squatting sp- right. spectacular amounts of weight. But he was, I believe, he said he was thirty before he took steroids. So he was a full time cop, and uh, he was competing. Just like, I mean perfect genetics mm-hmm. just perfect i mean he's just a stud mm-hmm. and then realized he couldn't beat these guys yeah, there's no way tired of getting his ass kicked and so yeah. then he got on like he yeah. had uh that's when he went oh. when he was a cop <laughs> oh <my laughs> how'd you get pulled over by that guy <laughs> yes sir here's <laughs> license sir <laughs> sir sir don't squeeze my head like a zit <laughs> he's uh just a really sweet guy too an awesome guy but he was very honest about it he's like i couldn't compete i was tired of getting my butt right. my butt kicked right and then he started taking so it. So in the USC, it's not allowed now? No, 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 no. A lot of people get busted. Hmm. Uh, they get busted for trace amounts that are um, in um, supplements. Hmm. Like, say, if you buy, like, creatine, there's a lot of, like, cheap supplements that you'll buy that they make them in vats. And the vats that they make them in, they, they're, like, in China, mm-hmm. and they don't clean these vats. Yeah. So they might have made steroids right before they made your yeah. shit, yeah. and then they'll throw the next thing in there yeah. and mix up the creatine. And right. uh, there's a lot of that, a right. lot of cross-contamination. You know, I just interviewed recently for the Traffic Podcast. We also have a podcast. I just started doing a podcast. I was so nervous Why? before talking to I've interviewed so many people, but I'd never done it for a podcast. So I was here sitting to talk to my first podcast interviewee, and I was shaking. I'm ner- I don't really? know, because when it's something new and you've never done it, I don't know. I just got nervous. I was, Am I going to be able to be half as good as Joe? <laughs> Go watch, if you ever get nervous, go and listen to the early ones that I did. They're fucking terrible. Yeah, you should, yeah it's like me and tele, television. The first things that I did on TV, it was, my, it was my husband, actually, who you met, Darren. Yes. Traveling around the world with me, filming our first assignment. or We were freelance journalists. We bought a little camcorder in Syria. I was living in Syria at the time. Uh, I, 9-11 had happened. I wanted to be close to the action, learn Arabic. And we bought a little ta- camcorder. And we went and we filmed with jihadis uh, crossing into Iraq to fight against the Americans. These were Syrian jihadis. And uh, it was our first story as a freelancers. And, you know, there was a moment where one of us had to decide who's going to be on camera. And I'm much more gregarious than he is. He's... Uh, you know, quieter than I am. And so we decided it was me. And he would turn the camera to me and say, okay, now tell us what's happening. And I could not put two words together. And he kept on giving me shit for this. Like, how can you not say something that is so simple? And I was like, oh, yeah, wait a second. I picked up the camera and I turned it to him. I said, okay, now you say those words. And he couldn't say them either. Well, it's you figured hard. it out. You're great at it now. You're great at it now. But I was going to say that I interviewed Tony Bosch. Do you know Tony Bosch, right? No. 
You do. He's I the do? guy. Yes, you do. Because I think you had one of your friends made the film about him. He's the guy, the steroids in baseball guy. He was the guy that was providing oh, steroids. Oh, the Billy Corbin documentary, yes. Screwball? Is Screwball. that what it was? Yeah, which is amazing. It's so good. It's so good. I can't recommend that enough. Yeah, it's so good. But that, So we interviewed him for the podcast. It's hilarious. The way Billy Corbin filmed it with oh, the little with the kids. kids. Oh, my God. It's brilliant. It is really, really brilliant. That's yeah, the guy. That's okay, okay, that's okay. okay. And he was saying, you know, I was asking, like, isn't it for somebody, he apparently lo- he loves baseball, has been a huge fan of baseball all his life, and then became Came the supplier of steroids for, uh, you know, the biggest big shots in, in baseball. And I was asking him, don't you think that's unfair, you know, considering um, that these are illegal and if just some people are taking them and others aren't? He was like, yeah, it's unfair is not to take them because everybody's taking them. Yes. You know, it's a, it's a, it's. Well, it's the way I felt about Lance Armstrong. You know, like when people, the, the real problem with Lance Armstrong was not that he was taking drugs. It was a lie. The real problem was the lies. Yeah. And also suing the other people that were calling him out. But in his eyes, they betrayed him and that they were selling him out so that they could get a cheaper deal. But they were doing it, too. And they were all admitting they were doing it. So they were getting, you know, uh, immunity. If you got rid of all the people that tested positive when they took away Lance Armstrong's jerseys or whatever, Mm -hmm. you get a jersey from winning, you know, all his victories. I mean, he has them on the wall in his mm-hmm. house. If you took away all those, well, who wins then? Who wins those years? Well, you have to go back to 18th place to find someone who didn't test positive. Wow. Do you know that? No, I had no idea. 18th place. Mm-hmm. And that guy probably just had a really good chemist, and he probably was full of shit, too. Or maybe yeah. he, like, cycled off right before the race. Mm-hmm. It's a dirty sport. Bill Burr has a great bit about it. Mm-hmm. Bill Burr, the comedian, has a mm-hmm. hilarious bit about it, like our psycho is better than your psycho. It's like it's you're dealing with a dirty sport. It's right. a, a, an entirely dirty sport. They've been blood doping and they've been doing EPO mm-hmm. and testosterone and all these different things. And then there's a real argument that it's actually healthier to do that oh. with drugs than it is to not do with drugs because without the drugs your body has such a difficult time recovering from the massive amount of work you have to do when you're doing something like the Tour de France cuz you're racing yeah. every day for a long time yes super superhuman yeah. you know another sport that i had no idea where apparently uh, it's used heavily it's in tennis did you know that really yeah well i did know that one what well, we don't have to say the name but there was a, a prominent tennis star that mm-hmm. uh, the World Anti-Doping Agency or one of them came knock on this person's door and they locked themselves in a safe room. And uh, w- with, said, with, yeah, with. they said, oh, I think I think there's an, uh, uh, an intruder, someone trying to come <laughs> and get me. And they, <laughs> they avoided being tested. Was this reported? Yes. Oh, yes. Wow. Oh, I don't know who that Very is. popular story. Wow. Yeah. No need to dig up dirt, Jamie. <laughs> I know, I, don't I, Google it. Don't I happen to already know who you're talking about, so I don't need I to. I bet you do. <laughs> and a lot of people are like, hmm, things that make you go, hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I didn't know that, though. But I just assumed that any explosive athletic endeavor, whatever it is, sprinting. That was the other thing. Remember when Ben Johnson won the Olympics? Yeah. Carl Lewis was on the shit, too. Yeah. That's what's crazy. Like, Ben Johnson got shamed, and Carl Lewis was like... <laughs> like he was doing drugs yeah. too. They were all doing it. Yeah. They're like the the dirty secret about Olympic sprinting apparently is that they're all doing something. Yeah. yeah, then it's when you start asking yourself at what point does it make sense to make it illegal? Why not just like Have you seen Icarus? The Brian yeah. Fogel documentary? Yeah, it's so good. Woo. It's so good. So good. So it's good. and it's all about that, folks. It's all about the Sochi Olympics and about how Russia essentially Doped the entire it's Olympic team. Insane. It's insane. insane. Insane how they did it. It's crazy. The documentary yeah. is so well done because Brian Fogel, who is the uh, the director and the guy who made the documentary, he he had a plan, and his plan was film him with no drugs doing this bike race, and then come back next year with the supervision of an anti doping expert from the Soviet Union. In the middle of all this happening, it gets exposed that the Sochi Olympics, that the urine samples had been tampered with, and that there was like micro scratches on there, that they had devised some sort of a method to open up the urine samples and replace the urine with clean urine, and holy shit, it's crazy. It's insane, It's It is the craziest, that guy is still, the Russian guy, is still in hiding. 
I had no idea. Oh yeah, he's under like he, he's he gave state's evidence, so he's like this guy is wow. under witness protection Here program. Here in the U.S. Yes, yeah. allegedly he yeah. might be in Antarctica. Who the fuck knows? Right, where he is. Right, but right. they offered him as a guest, right. like like I don't like in some oh, sort of remote fashion. I think really? remotely. And he, you didn't yeah. want to? Well, well, I I talk about it. I, it's just one of those. I don't want to put him in jeopardy. Yeah. I feel like that's one of those. You don't want to do what I do. <laughs> no, I don't By think talking you're in jeopardy. To people. You're out. <laughs> you're <laughs> out in the open. I just think. That guy's yeah. life is in like yeah. real yeah. danger yeah, yeah. right now. I mean, he exposed the Soviet Union, the state, like the state sponsored anti doping mm -hmm. agency. I don't, I mean, I, the documentary and the whole case itself for sure put that guy's life in danger. Yeah, yeah that was a good one. It was, you know, it's whenever I do documentaries, when you start by watching it, you think it's going to be about one thing and then mm -hmm. something completely different. Those are the best stories yes. always. Yes, it's, it's amazing. So, good. so my take on the adult use of these things is very different than my take on the use of them for competition. Now, I've had people, Was it, it was Luke Thomas that was saying that they should just be able to take drugs, right? Wasn't it? I believe it was. He's got a really good argument for it. Um, that they're doing things, and they're, this is for fighters. Mm -hmm. They're doing things, they're just, they're, they're getting away with it. They're doing things in some sort of a sneaky way, they're microdosing, they're figuring out a way. And that um, if you just like regulated the levels that they could compete at and just let them do whatever they want, it'd probably be better for everybody. In the early days of the sport, and I'm sorry, Luke, if I've uh, distorted your argument. In the early days of the sport, it was Wild West and everybody was juiced to the gills. Like if you went, and in Japan, when they compete in Japan, it was actually in the contract that they would actually, not only would they not test they would say in all like my friend ensign Inuye, he's a legend in mixed martial arts mm -hmm. like one of the early pioneers and uh he said that when he was in pride it was in all caps we do not test for steroids it was in the contract wow yeah like <laughs> so they would test you and a lot, a lot of guys like no they tested everybody when we were that yeah yeah yeah. they test you they go god pee in this cup they said the throw it over there <laughs> get out there get juiced up like a friend of mine went to compete over there. They told him to get on steroids. They, oh, they, wow. they, this is one of the Japanese fight organizations. They told wow. him, we want you to gain weight. We want you to be bigger, stronger, right. better for TV. Yeah, look better good. for the show. Yeah, more money to be made. And, you know, mm -hmm. if you are on a host of these performance-enhancing drugs, you will have more endurance. You'll be able mm -hmm. to recover faster. You'll be able to train harder. Right. And you'll be able to endure more punishment when you're actually inside the mm -hmm. ring or the cage. So you think they should? No, <laughs> I, it's I'm torn. Here's here's my my real feeling, um, that this is we're trying to stick our finger in a well mm -hmm. or in a, a dam rather that has a, a bunch of holes and the holes are going to increase. There's going to be more and more holes, and then you're going to have genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. And I think we are mm -hmm. maybe one two genera generations away from CRISPR kids right. fighting in MMA, kids with perfect genes, mm -hmm. kids that when it, like. Say if they engineer uh, myostatin inhibitors into children. You know what myostatin inhibitors are? Myostatin inhibitors are, it's, it, it happens accidentally with animals sometimes, sometimes with cows, but commonly with whippets for some strange mm -hmm. reason. When they breed whippets, sometimes they have this weird uh, error in their genes mm -hmm. and they develop, uh, they have myostatin inhibitors in, in their genes. And their their myostatin inhibitors apparently what it does is it stops your body's like regulation of how much muscle you can grow. Oh, wow. So you have whippets that don't even look like real animals. Mm -hmm. If oh, you yeah. see them, you'll think they're photoshopped. You see them, that's a whippet. That's oh, a myostatin inhibitor God. whippet. Now a normal whippet is the one on the right. Whoa. Yeah. So they grow massive, <sighs> massive muscles, and wow. they literally look like. Like like a Hulk dog, like, like yeah. someone gave a dog some kind of crazy drug. Oh my god! And then there's the cow over there. Yeah, too. that's a that's a cow that also has uh, myostatin oh, inhibitors. Yeah, so you have a cow that looks like Ronnie Coleman, or Dorian Yates in his prime. You know, like yeah. we're just insanely huge. Wow. Um, now it happens occasionally in children, and there have been children that have been born with this aberration, mm -hmm. and they're massive kids. That oh, are just wow! I had never seen. That. Yeah, um, that yeah. one might not be. Right, yeah. That might be. There's there was oh, one the kid. kid. Kid, yeah. There was oh, one right. sad one where this uh, that the kid. That's father, that's right? steroids. The father was giving the kid steroids right. at a very early age. But there's if you Google myostatin inhibitor, did you like? I think the one in the middle 
That might be legit. Yeah, that, looks, that looks, this looks actually, Photoshop. Actually, it's like a. It looks like CGI. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I don't know. But there, look. anyway, there have been cases of kids mm -hmm. that have this genetic aberration, and uh, they're just freakily muscled as children. And you like think crazy. they're going to start trying to do that? Yes. Too. Yeah. I think they're definitely going to do mm -hmm. it. I think they're probably doing it already in China. Yeah. Look at that kid. Yeah. Okay. That's it. Yeah. For sure. Look at that kid. I mean, that is fucking yeah. insane. The kid's jacked. Mm. Oh, that kid's God. getting all the th second graders. Yeah, I mean, he's got the face of girls. like, a, yeah, exactly, a, a six-year-old and then the arms of a yeah. fighter. Yeah, so it's some weird uh, aberration. Now, w with CRISPR, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously I'm not a scientist, so I'm going to butcher this, but they're, they're able to, they're, there's going to be good things that they can do where they can remove genes that can cause leukemia, they can remove genes that can cause Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But they're also going to be able to alter people, and it's just a matter of time. There's, I think right now we're on the third iteration of CRISPR, I believe, where they they keep improving the method. Now, as they continue to improve this method, there's going to be innovation uh, with, with everything. N nothing ever stops, and it's going to be worldwide. They're not – once this technology is reaching China and Russia – and wherever mm -hmm. who's to stop people from making people with this right. it's so scary well they've already yeah. used it on google uh crispr used on uh adults currently they've done it they've done it with people and they they actually did it with i think there was something they did in china i believe it was where it improved their cognitive function they were trying to engineer something it might have been something against HIV, to, the, the, a gene to stop them from potentially getting HIV, and it actually wound mm -hmm. up improving their cognitive function. So it's going to be weird shit they're doing yeah. with people. You're going to have, like, steroids and, are going to be, like, Yeah, if I could walk in the park compared yeah. to the rest. And cloning, too. I yeah. did a story about cloning once. And, Ooh. yeah, how in uh, Argentina, actually, which is sort of the center of polo horses, and the polo, the sport of polo, and they're uh, all the majority of the horses and the best teams are all cloned, and it's Whoa. all actually being done by an American company, uh, owned company by this American guy, who has diabetes, um, and who's I believe somebody in his family died from diabetes, his grandmother perhaps, and he's trying to figure out a way that he can clone parts of his body and make them healthier, and it's really fascinating Whoa. stuff. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah, but whole horses, whole teams of pol polo teams being run and you just cloned from cloned from the same horse, which was this champion horse. How many times can you make a copy of a copy till it's like a <laughs> shitty VHS tape? Apparently. Do you know what's so interesting? I had no idea. Is that you think of a clone, you think of something that looks exactly like the other. Apparently, the part that is more visible, which is the outward skin and, and the horse's the hair, uh, actually the hair... the. The color of your hair is has something to do with the temperature of you when you're in the the, the, the body, uh, in, before you were born, and so the horses that were cloned actually the hair were different colors, oh. but in the physical abilities um, and health wise the way your body operates uh, that's what's cloned. Right, like so if somebody wanted to make a perfect team of bodybuilders, they would just clone Ronnie Coleman yeah. and just make a bunch yeah. of Ronnie Coleman. And the Coleman's. rest would look similar to him, but right. they're not identical. Wow. Yeah. But physically they'd have and also apparently they were saying that the personality of these cloned horses were very similar to the original horse in terms of being fighters and you know, uh, not giving up and all that. Oh, that's what's crazy. Yeah, it's the, insane. The, and that they, oh, see, this is even crazier, how they, they believed, the owners of these horses, that they actually came equipped with some knowledge that you can only, that horses aren't equipped with, like the knowledge of how grass feels, or how, there was something about the, the game of polo that you have to learn and practice, and some of these horses were born with some of these characteristics. Wow. I know, it was insane. Do you have children? I have a son, yeah, 10 year old. Um, one of the things that I noticed uh, with uh, one of my daughters in particular, I, I have uh, an obsessive personality. When, mm -hmm. Like, if I'm trying to do something, I, I just can't stop thinking mm -hmm. about it. I want to get better at it. I mean, I've, I've had that since I was mm -hmm. a boy. My daughter has that, mm -hmm. but she doesn't have all the fucked up parts about me <laughs> that I had. Like, I had it because I wasn't getting any attention when I was young and I wanted to be great so that people would pay attention to me. She just has it. Mm -hmm. So, but she gets tons of attention. So she's like happy and confident, but she also, she's like a freak. Like uh -huh. she like concentrates on things. She gets really good at stuff, but it's very bizarre. My wife uh -huh. and I were looking at her. She's like, she's like a weird 12 year old version girl of version of uh -huh. me. How old is she? She's 12. Oh, 12 yeah. So it's this oh, very wow. strange thing that I'm like, 
this passed down clearly yeah because it's unusual the way she is right. i'm like this is very strange like to see this in a young yeah. girl i share i share some my, my son definitely shares some things with me like we both get so excited when we go into a plane every time even though i fly constantly <laughs> i still am the kind of person that i walk into a plane i step foot on a plane and i get excited about everything the air the food the everything like seriously and he does too and he is like that too actually wow. it's before we're on the airport and we look at each other as like yes <laughs> we're doing this together. And you think that's really well, well he's uh, he must have learned some of that from you no? Do you think he yeah, learned I don't it know. or do you think, I think it's genetic? I think it's partly genetic. I think we have uh, I I love to say that I have exploration in my blood because I'm Portuguese and we come from a long line of explorers um, yeah. around the world in history. Uh and he has it too. But I don't know. I think I think partly yeah, he just shares with me the joy of traveling and the exploration and the weirder the places. Like I took him to Morocco a couple of years ago, and because it was so unlike anything he had seen, he was in heaven. He wanted to dress with the same, uh, the jalabas, as they call them. The men mm. wear jalabas, these long dresses. He wanted to wear the jalabas. He wanted to do everything, like put the... Uh, the what do you call the thing the scarf on your head like the Tuaregs there because we went camping in the Sahara Desert and yeah he really embraces all of it it's really so maybe he's got you like your travel lust yeah yeah for sure. and the weirder it makes is sense. the more he likes it like that me. makes sense because it's like think of the things that people are inherently afraid of like mm -hmm. uh, I think it was Rupert Sheldrake was talking about this that children even children that grow up in New York City, they're not worried about car accidents right. or child molesters. They're worried about monsters. Mm -hmm. They're worried about monsters in the room. They're worried about monsters in the dark. And that, they believe, stems from some sort of a genetic memory of cats, mm -hmm. big cats, hunting us when we used oh, wow. to be pri you know, primates living in mm -hmm. trees. And that the thing that every chimp and every monkey is afraid of mm -hmm. is a fucking cat. Oh, wow. Like, if you live in the jungle, which we're... We all came from mm -hmm. Africa as human beings. Mm -hmm. That is what was killing us and eating oh, us. I had no idea. Yeah. So the thing that everyone's afraid of is something with big fangs. Wow. Oh, it's in sure. the dark. That's for cats. Sure. I'm going to tell you a story that happened to me. I actually told your team before coming in. Uh, I was. I am terrified. So I meet with cartel members. I meet with all these people all around the world. And usually I'm not tend to be scared. But there was. I'm terrified of big animals and especially big cats. I was in the Amazon once. I was doing a story about biopiracy there. And again, I was with my husband, Aaron. And we went deep into the Amazon, uh, like really deep, to camp with these two Brazilian scientists. And we were looking for poisonous snakes and poisonous spiders and the most poisonous creatures in the Amazon. We went out at night, in the middle of the night with them, with just flashlights and our snake boots. And uh, initially, I was kind of scared. Um, and, you know, they would pick up these really dangerous uh, fer de lance and the most dangerous snakes and all that. And I went back to camp after this night thinking, I am the bravest person in the <laughs> universe. I can do this as well, if not even better than men can. Uh, I came back and I wasn't afraid and I did this. It's something that terrified me, you know, poisonous snakes. But I did it and I'm so strong and I'm so powerful. I'm so brave. I'm the queen of the Amazon. And then I went to bed that night in these hammocks that we hung on trees out completely in the open. And I had the hammock on the far end because I was a woman and the scientist stayed and my husband next to me, but still I was more exposed than them. And in the middle of the night, in the Amazon, where it actually gets really cold, I didn't know that, um, but I woke up kind of cold and suddenly I felt it. And there was a breath right next to me, a warm, uh, smelly breath right next to my face. And I'm out in the open in this hammock and I was absolutely sure. Of course, it's, I know it's a jaguar. The scientist had just told us that he's not scared of anything except for jaguars because he knows that they're in this area and they've killed little kids. Um, oh, Jesus So this Christ. is happening to me in the middle of the night. And I had this reaction that I didn't think was possible. You know, when, when you have uh, nightmares when you were a kid and something horrifying happens and then you want to talk and scream and ask for help, but you can't, you're frozen. Paralysis. That yeah. actually happened to me where uh, I was suddenly, I feel, felt it here. I knew I needed to ask for help, but I completely froze and I couldn't get any words to come out. But apparently my teeth were shattering so damn loud that my husband next to me woke up and said, hey, are you okay? And I was able to say no. And then he came up with this flashlight and looked all around and didn't see anything and thought obviously I was probably dreaming. This wasn't true. It told me you're, it's nothing. I'm sure you've just imagined this. This didn't happen. The next morning, wake up. I didn't sleep at all, obviously. But 
my backpack was full of hair. And I was so ready to like turn to them and tell them, okay, see guys, see, you think I'm just afraid and I uh, imagine this stuff, but this stuff actually happened and here's the hair. And then the scientist like points out, uh, this guy Paulo, who's great, Paulo says, hey, Mariana, look there, there's a dog. And there's this little dog that had spent the whole night <laughs> sitting on my little backpack. So it wasn't a jaguar. It was a dog It was a dog, it. but oh my God. I'm terrified, terrified. I mean, especially since I was terrified of, of wild cats. And a guy in that. Texas got killed by a mountain lion yesterday. No way. Yeah, yeah, it was in the news this morning. How did, what happened? <laughs> got jacked. That's just what happens. You know, they, and, and it was really funny. Oh they God. were like, it's so, ri- there's people that were poo-pooing it mm-hmm. because uh, there was a mountain lion sighting in the area and some people think that he was killed by the mountain lion, but oh some people are saying, well, we're not sure. It's exceedingly rare that people right. get killed by mountain lions. Why, there's only been 30 recorded cases of people mm-hmm. being killed by mountain lions in Texas. Like, bitch, that's 30. It was right. 30 werewolves right if 30 people have been killed by werewolves would you be skeptical <laughs> right. if you found a man torn apart wouldn't, wouldn't you just assume you got <laughs> killed by a werewolf oh we got 31 course. now like yeah cats kill people right. they're just if they're for sure if they know for sure they can get away with it right. and they're hungry especially if they're old right. they kill people all the time it says there's no evidence of a predatory attack so by what? a mountain lion or maybe even any other animal. Yeah, but there's other... Here, I'll send you another I, article that says there is evidence. All right, I'm looking from uh, a couple hours ago right now. Yeah, there's several didn't. ABC News. Go that's to the, the ABC one I, News the one. one. I had up. Oh, did they change it? They it changed Texas their position? Texas officials conflicted on whether Mountain Lion is responsible for man's death hmm. three hours ago. And so how did he die? I mean, how did they find his body? Was it mauled or not? Well, we're not going to know unless we get real, real right. data from yeah. it. Right. But... Uh, yeah, uh, it look, happens, and I'm terrified. Of there's a crazy cats, video why, of yeah. a guy walking down oh, this road, it. and the cat comes rushing it's at him, insane. Th- throwing her paws. It's like insane. I, oh my god, yeah, oh my it, god, he's how, backing up, screaming. And how well did he do? I mean, I he did amazing, not, right? He kept his cool. He kept I know, filming. amazing. Crazy. He's amazing. Yeah, but I didn't know. I kind of knew how fast they were, mm-hmm. but I didn't know it would be that terrifying. Like the movement that the mm-hmm. cat was making, like waving mm-hmm. its arms out wide, yeah. like coming at him like a demon. I know, like a like demon. Like a demon. Totally. And they're just wandering around. People are like, oh amazing. My uh, in uh, my heard, old neighborhood. But, I heard that one that was like protecting it. From, yes. Uh, it's well, like he saw yeah. the babies yeah. first, right and then away. he started walking towards it, and then it started walking towards mm-hmm. him, and then he started backing up, and it chased him. Mm-hmm. Um, my friend in my old neighborhood uh, had stopped outside of her house and uh, um, she saw a mountain lion and started filming it. And while she was filming the mountain lion, uh, a second one ran right by. Look at this. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a big where, ass where cat. Was that's in fucking Calabasas. In that's, that's in, yeah, that's a suburb of LA. LA big, yeah. two cats. Two oh. big ass predatory cats. Yeah. Just there's a lot around. of them in LA. Oh actually, yeah. Lot, yeah. Well, there's some of them that have been collared, and there's some of them that haven't. Right. And there's uh, a lot of people that think it's wonderful that they're around. Right. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, okay. I'm, look, I'm glad they're real. I I love the fact that a mountain lion is a real animal. <laughs> but they shouldn't be in fucking Calabasas. Jesus Christ, you right. hippies. Right. Like, kill that thing. Right. Net it. Do whatever you got to do. <laughs> Get it the fuck out of there. Like, they're just eating there. a bunch of dog eaters yeah. and kid eaters. Right. Listen, it will definitely eat a baby, 100%. You got your little baby wandering around the middle of the night. It shouldn't be. But if it was and that cat came along, that baby's dead. Yeah. It's going to eat it. They'll, they'll eat everything. They eat dogs. They eat cats. They eat everything they can. They did a study in San Francisco where they, um, you know, whenever they, they have uh, what's called a depredation permit, when they find that a cat's been killing a bunch of animals, they'll, they'll issue a permit where you can kill it. Mm-hmm. When they kill these cats, the, the sh- most shocking thing was 50% of their diet was pets. Whoa. Yeah, 50%. Yeah, 50% with dogs and cats. Yeah, coyotes. Do you know coyotes also in L.A. are responsible oh, yeah. for a lot of little pet dogs and cats. Killed my daughter's yeah. dog. Really? Yep. Yeah. Killed uh, all my chickens. Right. Yeah. Oh, coyotes are gross. Yeah. I fuck, mountain lion killed my dog in Colorado. I lived in Colorado. One of my dogs got killed by a mountain lion. They're no joke. No, they're not. They're fucking s- sketchy animals, mm-hmm. and they live around people for that very mm-hmm. reason. And look, no, man, you're in their territory. Right. Like, okay, <laughs> what are you, a mountain lion? No, it's a person's house, you right. fuck. Like, Wait, it's not I- theirs. Once you put a house there, it's yours. Right. 
Can I pivot to bears right now? <laughs> You yes. had you had a guest actually a few times already. Steve Vanilla. Yes, and yeah. you know that the guy that he tells a story about when they were attacked by bears, the guy that he tells always that on his team actually rode the back of the bear. Yeah, because the bear was he was our assistant. Uh, Dirt camera. myth. Yeah, Dirt myth. Yeah, he's in our team. He filmed the cocaine. He filmed all our episodes. Oh, of this. he's great. He's incredible. He's wow. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, he was the guy who was literally as the bear yeah. charged them, found himself somehow on the back yeah. of the bear as it's running down the hill. That's right. Yeah, so for Garrett. like several yards, Garrett was on the back of a <laughs> know, fucking massive insane. bear. You hear him telling the story, which was when we hired him. I was like, okay, tell the bear story. It's insane. It's a crazy story. It's There's so uh, crazy. many of my friends were there. My friend Remy uh -huh. was there. My friend Giannis was there. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of the guys mm -hmm. in that crew, and they all tell it the same way, that everyone was just like, y you go to a place that you didn't know your brain, like a room in your brain mm -hmm. you didn't know you have. Like, oh, look at that. You've never been in here before. This yeah. is what happens when you're about to die. Mm -hmm. This is what happens when a, a giant super animal is about to eat you. Right. Oh, my God. That scares me. Yeah, those so bears much. are the biggest bears in the world. Yeah, I know. That area of a Fognac Island, that's like, those right. are the, like the Kodiak Island bears. They're, yeah. That's Alaska. Yeah. And then Ooh. you keep thinking about the Revenant in the scene. Oh. <laughs> when are the Caprio? <laughs> yeah. Um, and they're terrifying. But again, I love that they're real. I love, like, I'm not a person that thinks you should go and, kill all the the predators that kill people i i love the fact that we have this rich sort of uh just tapestry of life there's so many different things and i love the fact that there's so many different things but they shouldn't be in calabasas you know and they, they want to like make wildlife corridors over the 101 because mm -hmm. these cats keep getting hit by cars like um hey guys maybe we just concentrate on keeping them healthy where people aren't <laughs> Like it's not, I don't think we should encourage, right. you know, this, there's all this weirdness that comes in California when it comes to these animals. Like they kill just as many of them as they used to, but they only kill them by hiring people to kill them. They don't allow hunting anymore. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other places that they have problems with mountain lions, hunting is still legal, like Colorado. Like uh, my friend Johnny, he is a, a hunting guide in Colorado and he gets hired to hunt mountain lions because these mountain lions will take out calves mm -hmm. and cattle mm -hmm. and they they'll attack livestock right. and once they start going into it, so they have the wildlife um management, management. companies right. they have these sort of very calculated processes mm -hmm. where they determine how many tags can be mm -hmm. issued and how many mountain lions can s be sustained mm -hmm. in an area without them encroaching on you know, livestock mm -hmm. and things along those lines. And then you get to this like animal rights argument where people are like, hey, they have a right to, you know, they should, we're in their land. You know, you shouldn't do anything. You should leave them alone. And this is sort of what they've decided to do in California. In California, they, they the ultimate goal, California is weird in that it's not Department of Fish and Game. It's Department of Fish and Wildlife. Mm. And so the, that's on purpose because they don't want to think of these things as a resource that people hunt. They want to think of them as wild animals that they mm. protect. And so the Department of Fish and Wildlife is in many ways populated by people who are animal rights activists versus mm -hmm. people who are hunters and fishermen and conservationists and people who understand this sort of pragmatic approach to managing wildlife. It's a real complex issue. And it's uh, they've decided to just let these animals handle themselves. And I talked to one person who's worked with the Department of Fish and Wildlife who said their ultimate goal is to have no hunting at all in California. They would like the animals to manage themselves. Right. But when that happens, then the animals kill dogs and wildlife, and then you kill those animals. So they don't manage themselves. So you're paying people to kill the yeah, animals. Yeah, but it's like... Though. It's sneaky because right. it's like you look like you care more about the animals mm -hmm. because like we don't allow hunting mountain lions mm -hmm. here in California. Yeah, but you, you still kill just as many. You have like hired killers who go and track them down and kill them. Mm -hmm. Like it's, wow. it's very weird. Mm -hmm. And people who live on ranches, they have a completely different attitude because they see these things dragging deers across the road or attacking calves and – it's like you live around monsters. Yeah, they're on, yeah, they're on the front line seeing Yeah, you're, like, you're, yeah. you're dealing with monsters. And again, I, I love those monsters. I'm glad they're real. Right. I've seen mountain lions twice in my life, and it's a pretty cool thing to see them. It's wild. It's yeah. like 
you're seeing this thing that somehow or another manages to exist around people and, 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 and it hustles and it makes its way. But Yeah, one of the episodes we did was actually about tigers and tiger trafficking, wildlife trafficking. Was that about people that own tigers? Both. Like, so, okay. Yeah, so we looked at Asia where they're killing, um, you know, chopping up and using tigers to sell for tiger wine, which is a luxury good in Asia. A wine? Yes. It's, they seep the tiger bones, the older the, the tiger and the, the more they're wild, so instead of being farmed, because they're also being, tigers being farmed in Asia, but the wilder, they, if they can catch them from the wild, it's even better. And they seep them in these vats of rice wine and they stay for years and years and then they sell this for incredibly, really expensive Wait, how do they bottles do it? of wine. They seep the tiger. So they kill the tiger. They kill the tiger. They're and then they let the body the rot? And then in they a let the in a vat of, vat of rice wine, <gasps> and then uh, you, you might actually be able to find a photo of the, one of these things. And, that sounds uh, disgusting. And then they stay there for years, and then eventually they make little bo- or big bottles of this stuff and sell them for a ton of money. How much does tiger wine go for? <sighs> they can go for anywhere from like three hundred, four hundred dollars for a bottle to thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Have you tried tiger wine? No, I did not. No, uh, it's. Uh, did also you feel tempted? Yeah, so this so is not that the big. Is the and then bones? there's one that you can see the whole tiger. Is that the bones yeah, in that those bottle? Yeah, those are the bones. In, so in our in our film, you can actually see the vet. Do they the just tiger. use the bones, or do they use the tissue as well? The pelts, they usually take it out because they are also oh, sell the whoa, pelts. Whoa, this is crazy. Yeah, it's tiger very, very bone sad. trade. Shocking reason why people. Oh, you see, yeah, that's that's a good one. The first one, if you press that. That one picture. There. Oh, you see that? what? Yeah. Oh, my God. So they suspend this tiger carcass inside this enormous vat of wine. Let me see that person's face again. Do the whole thing. Look at the dude. Is that a woman? Uh, He's got a mullet. I don't know. It's hard to tell. It's non-binary. Don't be rude. I thought it was a thumbs up. That could be anything. You get out of here. We're uh, doing good things. So like, we look went, at that carcass. That's crazy. Yeah, so we were trying to figure out who were the people involved in this, um, you know, sort of tiger cartel land. Um, oh, that's you. That's for you guys. That's National Geographic. Yeah. That photograph. Yeah. So was this something that you actually physically saw yourself? We didn't see <gasps> that vet, but we look saw at that picture. other things. Look yeah, at that picture. Really that picture is wild. Wild. Do they take the meat off of that thing before they put it in that, or does the meat just rot off? I'm actually not sure. I know they definitely take the pelts because they can make a lot of money out of it. Go the back pelts. to the photo, Jamie. Scroll down so I can see that. That is wild. Yeah. That picture is so disturbing. It's just so weird. Right. It's like it's got no tissue on it, but it's it's like a dinosaur in the zoo where it's like sort of suspended in the in a walking yeah, position. It's so strange. Mm-hmm. And yeah. So so much money to be made by these tigers. But then we came to the U.S. and we looked at. A crazy, shocking number, which is that there are more tigers in captivity in the U.S. than there are in the wild in the entire There's world. more tigers in Texas than there are in all the wild of the world. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. That's I had a insane. whole bit about it in my 2016 Netflix special. Really? You did? Yeah, about how crazy Texas is. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, there's... I think there's somewhere around 5,000 tigers just in Texas. Yeah, it's insane. And I, I, I like that we so tend to look at Asia and criticize these people are being crazy and I can't believe what they do to these animals and yet the commodification of tigers is happening right here because it's all they're making money out of you know roadside zoos and taking selfies with the tigers and or just rich assholes who have a bunch of tigers yeah was uh Mike Tyson had a tiger and it was really funny he was telling me on the podcast (laughs) that uh I think he's buying horses and someone said to him uh you get a tiger what's up we got a list up here they had used tiger parts for there's a lot of various tiger parts that are used for various yeah. Uh, medicine things. How much of it I has mean, to do with not, erectile it's not scientifically, dysfunction? It's obviously been Co- scientifically correct. Dis- disproven. To yeah. The, uh, exactly. Is the, the fat prescribed oh, for dog wow. bites. Feces, a cure for boils, hemorrhoids, hemorrhoids. and alcoholism. Ooh. Oh. Eyeballs, treatment for malaria and epilepsy, nervousness or oh, fevers fever. in children, convulsions and cataracts. Claws, a sedative for sleeplessness. Wait, the brain. Can you go up, go up again? The brain is the best. A treatment for laziness and pimples. <laughs> <laughs> now, what is it about certain countries? Because I, I don't want to say Asia, but it's in Asia, where they they like these weird exotic things that are proven to not be f- functional, like like rhino horn. Yeah, rhino horn is a thing that they love in uh, certain circles in China, right? That's where the big trade, like, yeah. mm-hmm. and it's the way it was described to me by a friend who's Chinese was that it's more of that it is 
very difficult to get. Mm-hmm. And like, so you have some people over your house and you're like, would you like some rhino horn? Mm-hmm. And like, oh shit, yeah. this, this dude's balling. <laughs> like, he's, he yeah. brought out the rhino horn tea and you all sit around with pinkies up uh-huh. and drink your wine. But not that you really think that, it, I mean, they know about Viagra. It doesn't, it's not, they don't think that this is really. I think they do. I do think because they're think paying they so does? much money, I do think that they believe in really? traditional Chinese medicine. There's a belief that a lot of these things have been scientifically disproven, but they still believe it. I do mm. think because who is going to pay, you know, ten, twenty thousand dollars for a bottle of Tiger wine if they don't think that it's not just for the taste? Uh, I think b- b- the way my friend was describing it, the, the culture values things that are difficult to get, for that sure. are exclusive. And, yeah, the more expensive it is, yeah. the more difficult it is to get. That is for sure. But I think there's an enormous uh, the the the, med- the traditional medicine part of it, right? Because there's a, well, I think a big part of it. Too. It's probably difficult for us to understand this long history of the use that's been like it's been sort of celebrated use of rhino horn and tiger parts and shit yeah but i mean it's, it's like, yeah it's like we don't have a frame of reference right i mean we we could if we you know don't want to be unpopular but if we looked at religion right they poured here, your and, shot you, you know, of the rhino <laughs> horn would you would you take a little just see what's up <laughs> Or a tiger I should, wine. I should have tried that tiger wine. We actually found, we got our hands in a tiger a bottle of tiger wine for the show, and we were able to gain it. Get, Did anybody it try it? No, we didn't. We, I opened it up and I smelled it, and it's just a powerful alcohol smell. Um, not particularly good. Not some, nothing that I would want to try. Like a moonshiny type smell. Yeah, but kind of bitter, like not. That's the tiger. Like I, I would drink moonshine any day. <laughs> God, it's so strange what people uh, are willing to do to get something that's not even that. It's not enjoyable. No, like I know. Not, it's not like you eat it and you're like, oh my oh, God, this, this is, is the most so amazing thing yeah. ever. Did you see Sea of Shadows, the documentary about the tatuaba fish? And no, what is it? About the, the what? Vaquitas. Tatuaba fish is this fish that exists only in the Gulf of Mexico, apparently, and it's a uh, highly prized. The bladder of the tatuaba fish is highly prized in Asia and China as well for its medicinal value, which has been disproven too. But in order to get the tatuaba fish, you have Same yeah, this shot. is a wow, pretty fish. And they're ki- no, so they're, that's the vaquita. In order to get the tatuaba fish, they're killing the vaquitas. What is there's that? only like, like a, a couple dozen it? left or something. What? Yeah, they look like dolphins. No, that's the tatuaba. <laughs> okay. Sorry. The other one is the vaquita that has the round nose over there. That's the vaquita. Why do they kill the vaquita? Because they get caught in the nets, but it's the only place <sighs> oh. in the world where these vaquitas, and there's only like 20 left or something like that. Really? Just a few dozen left in the world, and they're these beautiful creatures. So the, the film is actually really well done. They, um, it's also a National Geographic film, but uh, they go and explore the whole market for this and how cartels are involved. And wow, what a really pretty animal. It's beautiful, right? It's like a dolphin fish. Yeah. Oh, it has a blowhole. It's so pretty. Wait a minute. So is it a dolphin? That, is it a mammal? This is a, called a vaquita. Yeah, I believe it's a mammal. Oh, wow. It's just a weird porpoise. So cool, right? Yeah, very. Yeah. But very again, strange. It's sad that so many of these are being destroyed just because of and this is because only 30 remain in the wild 30 wow. I see yeah and so this is because of uh this one fish and mm. what is so great about this one fish again it's the belief that it has some sort of medicinal value the bladder of the tatuaba fish um yeah you know um in bc uh you're not allowed to if you hunt bear like they mm-hmm. hunt like black bear is a a it actually tastes good. Like it's a, a commonly hunted uh, mm. meat in terms of um, like the the pioneers used to uh, hunt deer and like even bison. They would just mm. cut the tongues out and use the hide and they would hunt black bear for the meat. Weird. Like black. I've had black bear. It actually tastes good. Does it? Seems like it shouldn't, but mm-hmm. it tastes good. But the point is that because of uh, Chinese medicine, in Chinese medicine, bear gallbladder mm-hmm. is very valuable. That's right. So people were shooting bears just for the gallbladder. Mm-hmm. So in BC, if you hunt bear legally, you're not allowed to gut them because they want to make sure that you're not doing it just mm-hmm. for the gallbladder. So in some sort of a weird twisted logic, you leave the gallbladder there to rot because you can't be in possession of a bear gallbladder. Oh, wow. So it's really anti-conservationist because like, I, first of all, I don't think there really is a medicinal purpose for no, the bear gallbladder, but... Um, in certain animals, like with uh, buffalo, when the, the Native American, like particularly the Comanche, would eat the buffalo, they would s- take the gallbladder and squirt the bile 
over the liver and they would eat raw liver and use the bile as seasoning because it's kind of salty, I guess. I've never tried it this mm-hmm. way. Uh, but so they had a use for it. But if you ever did that with bear, like bears are predators, like you can't eat them raw. Like you would, you would get really fucked Sick. up. You'd get yeah. trichinosis and right. all sorts of parasites. Right. So, but I don't know what they're doing with the gallbladder. They, they think, but it's so common that they actually had to pass a law to say that you can't gut the bears. So when you shoot a bear, yeah. you have to leave all that stuff. You can't be in possession of it. So like if you shot a bear um, and you you know took the bear and you know butchered it and all that stuff, you have to leave the guts. And that's guts. because they're trying to prevent it yeah. from being sold to the black yeah. market. Yeah. yeah, because people will hunt them yeah. just for the gallbladder. Right. And we'll pay a lot of money for them. And particularly BC, like Vancouver has a yeah. large Asian population. Mm-hmm. And some of these people have this belief that there's something in the gallbladder. Right. The, the sea bladder from the fish, it says in this article that uh, many of the Chinese store them as they would store gold. They cook them in soup. It's good for their skin. Instead of buying a Ferrari, they buy a bladder or two. They sell for <laughs> upwards of $100,000 a piece That's insane. for one. Insane. Yeah. Yeah. It's insane. 20 for a fish bladder. Mm-hmm. Wow, it's yeah. not the, it's like the bladder that allows them to stay buoyant. What what a, yeah, it's so yeah. oh, so it's an air bladder. Oh. Yeah, it's it's a so swim bladder. It's weird. It's weird wild. things that people like, like sharks fin soup. Mm-hmm. Have you ever had sharks fin soup? No, I had it once, long time ago, like before I ever heard that it was a bad thing, like that they were killing sharks for it. I think, like in the maybe the early '90s or something like that. I don't even remember where I was, but I remember eating it going, oh, it's okay. You had it at a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> I think I might have had it when I was young, too. Yeah. I think of it. yeah. Like, I think it was okay to have back right. then. And then eventually, uh, I watched some documentary uh, where I saw that they catch these sharks and just hack their fins mm-hmm. off and throw them back in the water. I'm like, whoa. And you stopped eating it? Yeah. Well, I only <laughs> ate it once. I don't even remember. I'm pretty sure I ate it, mm-hmm. but it might have been bullshit. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. sometimes you go to a Chinese restaurant and, like... Uh, my friend Ed told me that at some Chinese restaurants, they would say it was scallops, but it was really skate wing. <laughs> so they would take like, and they would punch holes in mm-hmm. a, like a stingray mm-hmm. wing and sell that as scallops. Like, I don't know, but whatever. Um, that was, that's a thing where for whatever reason it's prized, but it's not that good. Like there's weird thing like lobster. Like if lobster somehow or another was like some thing where you really shouldn't eat it because it, it it's terrible for the environment, it's destroying lives, and there's only four lobsters left, and look, I got lobster for dinner. It was like ooh, and he sat around and ate it, and you know put fucking tin foil over the window right. so nobody could see in. <laughs> then it would make kind of sense. Like goddamn, lobster is delicious. <laughs> lobster with melted butter is pretty tough. Pretty tough it's to pretty beat. Good. It makes. At least a little bit of sense but from what i understand like these things whether it's a tiger wine or you know rhino mm-hmm. dick or whatever you're eating it's right. not good stuff there's a dish in portugal that i love and that has been banned that i used to eat as a kid it's the baby eels have you ever tried it no it's the best so you it's know it's been banned it's been banned meanwhile because you can get heroin there kill- <laughs> <laughs> I know, for, for, without going to prison <laughs> uh but i used to eat it a lot and yeah we call them angulas in portugal it's also a dish apparently in spain but they make it better in portugal and uh it's full of Olive oil and garlic, which is all you need oh, to make something taste really sure. good. And it's these tiny little worms, essentially. They're mini baby eels. And I guess it's bad for the environment, so they stopped eating the uh, you stop. But that's the kind of thing that I understand, again, like the lobster filled with yeah. butter, where you don't understand why you'd pay the amounts of money, because it is right. really good. Yeah. yeah, things that are delicious make sense. Yeah. yeah but it's, like but fish bladder or, or tiger soaked in the... For years and years, and but it's that. weird stuff. That's exclusive is weird. You know, it's it's like there's a desire to be one of the few people that I can that. eat this thing. That. Yeah, yeah. It's just uh, it's it, it appeals to a weird aspect of human nature. Yeah, I mean, you can apply that to cars as well, and it's all the well, stuff that I don't. In doing this show, uh, your your show is all about trafficking things. Mm-hmm. Um, was what, what was the most disturbing? Was there a most disturbing episode for you? There were a bunch of situations in each episode. I think we did one actually. I've been, you know, I've covered uh, the gun uh, sort of trade and illegal guns here in America, but I had never 
Um, but And I've always wanted to do a show about where I explore the pipeline of guns going down south from the U.S. to Mexico and how it's contributing to the violence there. And we were given incredible access. Um, the film essentially started with a, a car of a woman being loaded with AK-47s and AR-15s in L.A., just a few minutes from my house, uh, right next to the 710 freeway on the middle of a weekday night. It's insane. And we can see them packing the dr- guns. We interview them. And these are L.A. people, people who live in L.A. and who work essentially for the cartel. Um, and we saw them packing this car. And then we saw that night we follow that car cross the border into Mexico. Nobody stopped them. I mean, there isn't even any border patrol when you're going south, only when you come north. And then we saw the guns being sold to the middleman um, and then eventually heading to Sinaloa. And we were in Sinaloa. I don't know if you read in the news last year, there was a, um, when Ovidio Guzman, who's the son of El Chapo, remember he was... Um, oh, yeah, we saw that. Right, yeah. and then the, they basically took hostage of the whole city. There was a siege of the city of Culiacan, the capital of Sinaloa, uh, and the cartels wouldn't let it go and were th- threatening the whole city with violence if the authorities wouldn't release um, El, Sa- El Chapo's son. And uh, we were actually in Sinaloa reporting when this happened. And all around, there were, again, American guns. There was AK-47s. There were even 50 cals. There were trucks with 50 calibers oh coming from the U.S. And, uh, and then, yeah, and we filmed with, essentially, we spent time with three sicarios, three gunmen from the Sinaloa cartel. All of them had and owned uh, American guns. And uh, since then, two of them have been killed. So we spent time with three, and it's been only a year, and two of them have been killed. And they were 20-something-year-olds. Um, and at the end of the film, and I think, you know, we, we thought, okay, we've, we've gotten to the terminus of what they call uh, the Iron River, which is the pipeline of guns coming from the U.S. to Mexico. Called the Iron River. Wow. They do. They even have a saying for it, which is, Mexico, uh, the U.S. supplies the guns. Mexico supplies the corpses. That's what I, we heard, like one of the guys that we interviewed said. Um, and the U.S. has become the supermarket of guns um, for Mexico and for a lot of Latin America. You know, I spent time uh, reporting on the violence in Brazil, and you go to the favelas in Brazil, and, you know, you look into the guns and where they came from, and it's from the U.S., the majority of them. Um, did you ever uh, look into the Fast and Furious debacle? I did. During the Obama yeah. administration? Yeah, it was a debacle. It was yeah. horrible. You know, Explain I, to people what happened. It's been a long time, but I'm trying my best. Uh, what was happening is that the, you, the ATF, which is the agency responsible for tobacco and firearms, was allowing... Um, had an operation happening where they knew guns were being sold and smuggled to the to Mexico, and they were allowing this to happen because they were trying to figure out them gain information from this. And uh, what happened is that one of those guns eventually was used to kill a border patrol agent. I believe. I think it was an ATF agent. Or is an ATF? Yeah. Oh, sorry, so I think. used to kill an ATF. Or agent. maybe it might have been border. I can't, can't remember. But either but way, they, it was they, yeah, horrible. they were heavily criticized for this, uh, for sure. Um, they literally supplied guns to the cartel. Yeah, they were allowing them to go to the hands of the cartel yeah. because they say they were trying to get information, um, you know, from where those guns were going, which is essentially what we filmed. We saw the whole process of where they arrive, how they're shipped, how what they do to avoid border uh, How do they blocks. get the guns? It's insane. So I, I – this blew my mind. I had no idea. Um, so when they told me, okay, we're going to get access to this Iron River, this operation happening – and it starts in California. I said, There's, you're wrong. It can't start in California because we have the most restrictive gun laws. It's not possible. It's probably, you're wrong. Like, get, not let's the most get restrictive. Or some of the most restrictive in the country. You can get a handgun in California. Good luck trying to get one, in, one New in New York. York. I know. Yeah. New York has the heart, yeah. But some of the most restrictive, and uh, especially compared to Texas and Arizona. And I thought, you know, this is probably wrong. They're telling us it's California because we get... A lot of times they tell us it's one place because they don't want to spill the beans immediately before they trust us. And eventually they, uh, and eventually it was realized that it was happening in California. So we went to meet with this guy who lives um, in LA, just again, 15 minutes from my house. And there he was in this house packing the guns and he had his cousins working with him and helping him out. And uh, he says he's been doing this. It's been the family business for years and years. He started working for the family business when he was seven years old. Yeah. Um, and helping with the gun trade how and the drug trade. He's also he? involved in the drug trade. He was seven, he said. No, how old was he when you met him? Uh, now he's in his 30s. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. yeah. And uh, 
he, uh, and I talked and I asked him, so where, you know, and this was, one of them was a semi-auto, uh, AR-15. It had the scope. It was super professional looking. The other one was a bit little, was an AK-47. And then he had a couple of handguns. And I was asking, how did you get your hands in, in this? And I, having done reporting on this, definitely thought it was from a gun show or, you know, getting people to go to gun, to shops and buy stores and buy guns legally and then selling them on the side. And uh, he said uh, in his case, he gets most of his guns from uh, law enforcement, from LAPD or from military um, down in the military bases in Southern California. Yeah. And uh, that was really shocking. Wait a minute. Yeah. So LAPD illegally sells Guns. Or not? I'm not sure. It's not everyone, but uh, someone he, they from have a LAPD. connection. That's what he told us. He has a so, connection. So they get guns, mm -hmm. confiscate guns. That's right. And then illegally sell them to so, this guy yeah. who brings them down to the cartel. So the AK-47. He had, uh, I believe it was the AK-47. He said, so this gun here, for example, this belonged to my homie, my you know guy that works with me or I'm friends with. The LAPD found it, confiscated it, and then we have a connection, and they, they sold it back to us for $1,000. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, this is really hard to prove, and obviously Right. It's he not might have been bullshitting because he hates he could, cops. He totally could be bullshitting. Um, yeah. Maybe but how getting... does he get his hands on these, you know, right. guns? What, um, what are the other options? Like, is it only one source? I mean, so this is a guy that is done time in prison, so he can't buy them. Uh, right. I, you know. But I mean, um, is this were there other sources that were bringing guns down? Did you look at other cases of different no, individuals? No, so we were or, following this one group. So how this did you find out? Iron well, River. Without giving away your source, how did you find out about this? Through connections that I have mm -hmm. in this in that world, um, and it's one of the sort of bosses that we meet later on when we arrive in Sinaloa that we actually interviewed him in a, a strip club. And uh, he's the one, he essentially told me, it was because of me, I gave you access to this whole Iron River. And, you know, one of the biggest reasons why is because Americans always point as us Mexicans as being responsible for everything. And I wanted to show you guys, Americans, how it's your guns that are responsible for the violence here. Holy shit. Yeah, it was incredible. Um, what, now, when a, uh, an episode like that airs, is that when it aired yet? No, that's the last one, and it's a two-hour. It became, it was, there was so much there happening, and because we were there during the siege, and, I mean, they were arming themselves for that case, for the Ovidio Guzman. If that were to happen, they, we went and visited a bunker loaded with, again, AK-47s, AR-15s, the lot, where they were arming themselves for something, and then the event happened as we were reporting. So it's a two-hour, and I'm, that's a really good one. I mean, I don't know right now because resources are so strapped if there's anything that, en that anybody could do any differently than what's being done currently, like what, what budgets are. But I do know that your uh, piece on the OxyContin Express had a giant impact on on legislation. They, they Literally, people saw that and then people saw the podcast that we did and were alerted to what a gigantic issue it is. And politicians started talking about it. And That's right. Constituents started talking about it. And people were like, hey, what, what are you doing about this? Yeah, we were called by law enforcement around the country and senators in Florida trying to, you know, sort of get more knowledge of what we'd seen, what we'd witnessed, and if we could try and help in any way in changing the laws there. And eventually they did. I would think that if I was the cartel and I relied on this Iron River, I would not want someone like you exposing it just so I could snub my nose up at the Americans unless they're so brazen that they think no matter what happens, there's always going to be this pipeline of drugs and guns. And there is always going to be up a pipeline. And down. There really? is so much money to be made, and not just in Mexico, but here in the U.S., you know, with corruption and people being yeah. involved in this. There is not much... Uh, encouragement there for it to stop. And I think part of it, you're right, it's impunity. I mean, this guy can do whatever he wants. You know, he has been doing whatever he wants. They basically, with that siege, they made the Mexican government, they brought it down to its knees. And they said, if you don't release this guy, we are going to kill the families of the military. You know, they surrounded the compound where the military families lived. And they said, if you don't re release this guy, we're going to kill everyone inside. And they would have. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was a, a telling moment when they released him. Like, who is running this show? Oh. Because it's not the government. Yeah, yeah we spoke to a Sinaloa pol state police woman, actually, who was in tears, saying, you know, I was there, I went out, I 
protected Mexicans that day, my fellow Mexicans. And the moment that she realized that they were going to give him up, um, she just broke down in tears. And she said, all of this for what? You know, I put my life on the line repeatedly for what? <sighs> yeah. Um, do you think that these exposés that you're doing currently, these episodes, do you think that they have the potential to have the kind of impact that the Oxycontin Express had? I hope so. That's always the goal as a journalist. Always. You want to have some sort of impact. Um, you know, again, I'm not law enforcement. I'm not there to stop them from doing what they do, but I'm certainly there to create awareness. Um, Does that make your job harder, though, to know that if, if people find out that you can, in fact, put the brakes on whatever business, illegal business they're running? But I can't. But you, I, mean, you I can, can by, but by, by raising awareness. Yeah. 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 Oh, does it stop? Does it make my har job harder in terms of gaining access to these yeah. worlds? I don't think the people want this. I mean, in some situations, yes, people are making a lot of money. But I don't think that the actual, the majority of the operators, like the backpacker kids, you know, like the mule, um, you know, like the scammer in Jamaica that we interviewed, um, they, I, I truly believe that that's, if they could, they would, lead another life um did you go to nigeria for scammers no we went do you know jamaica has become the new front lines of so the new nigeria so the calls that you get on your <laughs> phone are actually coming from jamaica really it was fat it was one of my favorite episodes yes did we nigeria just make enough money to like we're out yeah i think we're on to nigerians <laughs> and jamaicans are just they're so have you been to jamaica no i have not it's i'm jamaicans i'm obsessed with them they're they have such Great accents. They can make, they can impersonate an American in a second. Really? Uh, yeah, they're really, really good. And so we spent time with like all these scammers and like surrounded with their bodyguards with guns. And one of them told us as we were started interviewing this guy called Victor, I'm putting on his mic and he tells me, I'll only let you do this, Mariana, because you're a woman. If you were a man, you wouldn't touch me, you know. And oh. then I go on. And I said, okay, Victor, what do you do? Let's start this. What do you do? And he says, you know what I do, Marianne. I'm in the money game. You call it scamming. I call it the money game. And then he said, you know, and then we start talking more. And then he says, look, I was even thinking of robbing you and your crew. I was going to take away all your gear. I'm going to rough you up a little bit. But you're a nice person. So I'll let, I'll let you be. <laughs> Whoa. And, uh, yeah, so we have ended up interviewing five or a handful of people uh, there and sort of listening to their stories and why they do what they do. And there was Tweety, the female scammer, she's an incredible woman, who tells us a story that she works at a resort in Montego Bay um, where full of Americans. And every day she goes to work knowing that the Americans make spend more money in a, a day at the resort than she makes in a week or a month working there. And she comes back home one day, and her grandfather is very sick and needs – an easy treatment, but can't get it because she doesn't have, she can't afford it because health care is very expensive in, in Jamaica. And she realized the only way she can get, she can save her grandfather is by turning to scamming. And she starts calling Americans. There are these lead lists that they actually sell for a lot of money. A lot of them are coming from call centers because Jamaica has become sort of a center for call centers because it's cheaper labor. They speak English fluently. So they do call centers for legitimate businesses? For legitimate businesses, and then they, on the side, they sell. They, or they get their the hands. Side. They get their hands on these lead lists, which is uh, names of Americans. I got my hands on some of these lead lists. And it's so like, they get the, say, like Dell Computer. I don't want to yes, say Dell. Yes, whatever what, it is. Any, whatever yeah. company yeah. has an issue with customer complaints or customer service, they call them. They, even, they answer the phone. Yeah. So they even get lists that come from Vegas casinos of clients, people that go to Vegas casinos. And so uh, somehow these scammers also have their hands on these lists with names from r hotels. And so I had, it was a stack, I don't know, 50 pages or something of name after name with phone numbers. So they call and they say, hi, Mr. Smith. And uh, they do the whole thing. And it's fascinating. We saw them doing it. And there's, they say something like, okay, so hi, Joe, how are you doing today? Hi, Mr. Rogan, how are you doing today? you say fine thank you <laughs> did you go to whole foods today or last week yeah i did i knew you did because sir you just won the lottery <gasps> wow won, i did you did it's a big prize it's a mercedes benz and it's waiting for you sir wow what do i have to do well you just have to pay the transportation fee and it's about five hundred dollars that's it? That's it, sir. 500 bucks for a free yep. Mercedes. Um, how do I pay this? Yeah, exactly. Should I use so my then, credit card? Yeah, or? so you can use your credit card. You can buy a little uh, credit oh. card, you know, one of those prepaid ones, and then you do it. And then, then they actually send you, in some cases, the 
key to the Mercedes Benz. Oh, that's hilarious. That's insane, right? So you're at home and you get the key and they call you, sir, have you received your key to your new, brand new Mercedes Benz? And you say, yeah, I have. Oh, so then, then dang, say, you're more than willing. Now you just have to pay tax and it's only $5,000. And oh, you go and you go and you go. Because you got your key. Yeah. So they get you for five hundred, and then they get you for five thousand yeah. once you get the key. Yeah, and then it's really sad because we also, you know, you know, show the other side, which is Americans, even some committing suicide because they've lost all their savings. It's oh, very boy. sad. Yeah, there was a show on Scammers once that was really sad because there was this man. He was in his sixties, and he was convinced there was this woman in Europe oh. that he was having a correspondence with. And it was uh, really a scammer. And it wasn't a woman he went after. over there twice. Yeah. He never had talked on the phone, mm-hmm. just exchanged emails and photographs and mm-hmm. never talked on the phone. But they made a plan to meet somewhere mm-hmm. twice. So twice this guy went over to oh, Europe my God. and his family, his daughter in particular, was trying to tell him. And you could see he felt like such a fool, but he was still holding out hope right. because he really was convinced but then here he was in Europe and nothing was happening. And he's like, where is she? Like, I told her we're here. This right. is oh, so sad. Oh, yeah. such a bummer. It's a, the romance scam, I think that's called. It's a bummer, right? But it's also, it's like. Don't you know, say it. Don't say it's it. It's the law of the jungle. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were going to say that it's, that because I heard this a lot. Like people are stupid who fall for this, but it's not. Like I've No, no, it's not. It's not stupid it's not that they're stupid they're vulnerable yeah. you know and it's it's weird when when you have vulnerabilities and then you have people that take advantage of those vulnerabilities you know that are also vulnerable like mm-hmm. financially vulnerable and they have a lot of incentive to try to do things and it turns out to be profitable and then it turns out to be their business and you go well that's awful that's terrible mm-hmm. but <laughs> is it terrible to buy an iphone because when you buy an iPhone, an iPhone, if you follow, you know, I, I, I talked about this uh, the other day with uh, Matthew Iglesias. If you follow an iPhone all the way down to where the metal comes out of the ground, oh, yeah. you find slave labor. I know. Like, this is a fact. Mm-hmm. When you go to Foxconn, you see the people that work for the, the, the company that actually constructs these phones. There's fucking nets around the building because so many people jump off the top of the roof. They just put nets up to catch them. This is, is that okay? Right, no, yeah. that's not okay. Well, you're taking it. So we're all somehow or another a part of this, this weird of food chain. Mm-hmm. And the food chain takes advantage of vulnerable people. Mm-hmm. If you call me up and say, you know, all you have to do is give me 500 bucks and, uh, you know, I'll give you uh, your key to your Mercedes that you just won. I'd be like, oh, for real? Yeah, hang on. And I'll just put the phone <laughs> down and I'll go watch TV and I'll leave. <laughs> Fuck you, man. Or I'll hang up on you because I'm not dumb. I know, but, but okay, but wait. So uh, there was a good but, friend of mine in L.A. who recently got one of these phone calls. It wasn't a Mercedes-Benz. They said it was L.A. Uh, or it was the power company. I don't know if they actually knew it was L.A. DWP, but they said it's the power company and mm. you are late in payments. And he was going through something and, he, it, you know, he might have and he believed it. And they said, you're very late in payments. And if you don't pay $500 right now in the late fees, we're going to cut the electricity at your house. And he was in the middle of doing a million things things as kids you know his job everything and decided okay what do i need to do give me i'll pay for it easily like oh and, boy and then yeah it was a scam so uh, yeah how much did they get him for i think it was like 300 400 500 something like that it wasn't thousands but it was definitely well he might have been distracted you know yeah. you zig when you should have zagged he, yeah i know zig when zagged. i love that this sense. is That's, the food chain yeah, yeah. this is the ecosystem it's weird i mean there's there's it's not like we were talking about the people that live in Peru that grow mm-hmm. the coca leaves. This is not fair. Nothing, nothing, nothing is fair. No. It's not fair to be them. And if they can make a phone call and trick some gringo into sending some cash, like, I don't know. I don't. There's, there's a sucker born every minute. But it's not it's just that there's a sucker born every minute. Like, it's not fair that you get to be born in I Philadelphia yeah. where this person is born in Peru. It's not fair. I'm not saying that you did something bad mm. to be born in, you know, a nice no, place. I know. 
but it's not fair. I think what many would argue that actually Peru is nicer than Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> well, in many ways, it's gorgeous, right? No, yeah. it's it's true. It's That's, uh, that is funny, right? Like true. financially, you're better off living in New York City. But yeah. as far as like natural Happiness beauty and, and yeah. beauty, yeah, we don't know. That was one of the things that was really strange was when um and 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 made me nervous was when the uh, people in the town found out that you guys were there mm-hmm. when you were with the guy that was making the coke and you had to get the fuck out of there yeah. immediately. What was that like? Yeah, it helped that I had Dirt Smith, Garrett Smith, the bear rider <laughs> with me <laughs> at that moment. It was crazy. So we just the whole day was insane. We finally get access. We get on the road. This chemist jumps into the car with us. We're going out there. And then we get there, and it's completely night. De- middle of the night, there is not even a moon that day. So it was dark, dark, dark. And, you know, we're Nat Geo, so we come geared with all these flashlights and headlamps and we're ready for everything that can happen. But we get there and the guy tells us, okay, no lights allowed because if the population, if the people around the villages see you, they're going to be pissed and they're going to come after you. So because we, the people need the money yeah, exactly. from the coke business. Yes. And they would have had to, uh, you know, given the okay, although this guy said it was his cocaine lab and he wanted to give us access. And so we just had to be discreet. That's right, but there was us. no way that you could get the green light from the entire village. No. They would never agree to it. No. So and also, the- he doesn't want the entire village to know that he's running his cocaine lab there. Right. So although they know that the whole economy is sustained on coca leaves and illegal cocaine, that, you know, they don't want, they don't know exactly where. I wouldn't say that the whole population knows exactly where the drug labs are. Um, that's hidden and secretive. So he was gaining his access. He didn't want the population, the people around it to know. And he also thought that if they were going to know, they were going to want to come after us, not just us, but him as well, and try to harm us. Or Was that the most danger that you had been in while filming this, this series? No. Uh, there were other moments when we were filming with the Sicarios, the gunmen in Sinaloa, for example, and they told us that while we're with them, we're protected, but if the Marines show up, that there's nothing they can do. The Marines will start firing at us, and we are going to be stuck in the middle. And two hours into filming with the Sicarios, their walkie-talkies start buzzing, and you, we know something's off, and they turn to us, and you could see they're panicked, and there's a Marine helicopter coming our way. And there's this really uncomfortable situation where we're, like, stuck they start going out with their cars. We go where our car is out in the open and we see the helicopter and do we follow them? And then they're going to think that we're with them and if they start shooting at the car, they're going to start shooting at us too. Or do we pretend that, uh, or we stay here and hide and look even more suspicious. So it was a really nasty moment. For all now, those. by Marines, the, the Mexican, Mexican Marines, Marines? Yeah, the Mexican Marines, which are feared um, in Mexico, very feared and you know, so, but, uh, see, from perspective of someone here, you think that everyone's on the take down there. The Mexican Marines were the ones that went after El Chapo and caught El Chapo. They're considered the the, They're cleanest, the only ones, the cleanest of the, the cleanest, the cleanest of the authorities. Yeah, the clean, down but, there. you know, but it's one of those things. Like in America, we think that no one is above the influence of the cartels, and that's the in Mexico the narrative. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and did you hear the story recently? Was it the minister, the defense secretary, I believe, in Mexico, who was caught at LAX yes. and charged with uh, in being involvement in the drug trade? Yeah, and then sent back to Mexico. So back and then, deals. I'm not sure what happened. Oh, there. they sent him back. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So they caught him. He's going to be charged here. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, sorry, go and ahead, then, take him. Yeah, some sort of conversation oh. happened behind closed doors between the Trump administration and the Mexican, and they let him go. Oh, fucking Trump. Yeah. <sighs> wow, what a crazy scene. Yeah. Um, when filming a show like this and then um, and then, and then releasing it, do you, does it give you uh, a sense of satisfaction of completion? Or do you feel connected to these each individual stories? Like, what is it like to make such an? In- it seems so intense. Absolutely, uh, they're all you know. We put so much. You have an idea how much work goes into every single one of these pieces you know it's months and months of preparation and then it's months of editing and it's you know it's been two years in the making two years to this day more or less when we started working on this series and it finally was released and yeah I mean every single second that you see in the film is thought out and heavily studied and researched to make sure that we're getting everything right and that we're making good television at the same time and that it's compelling well you nailed it you really did I mean it's so compelling it's so good I mean 
you're you're out there doing fantastic work. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, I just so want to say thank you. thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for being here. Thanks for coming on again. It was cool oh, to see you after it. all these years. It's been I wild. But uh, all right, good luck with the show. And tell Thanks, people sure. again um, what the name is, uh, when yeah, they can see it. For sure. So it's Trafficked, uh, 9 p.m. Uh, Wednesdays on National Geographic. And then you can catch me on the Trafficked podcast as well. We'll be competition for Joe Rogan's Yes. Podcast. And um, <laughs> there is it the is, show. Trafficked. It is. <laughs> and uh, social media, you're, yeah, I know you're Mariana, on Twitter because yep. that's how I got a hold of you. That's right, Mariana VZ on Twitter and on Instagram, which Instagram is my preferred method of uh yeah. Social media ing. Me too. All right. Thank you, Mariana. Awesome. I really, really Thanks, appreciate Joe. it. Great. Bye, everybody.